everybody. Thanks for showing up. Happy Wednesday. Uh, hopefully my microphone is behaving properly. I did some tests. Unfortunately, the problems that show up only show up after a while of using the microphone. Didn't quite have the time to try that this time. But uh, today, I'm going to be um, uh, I'm going to be playing Alleyway, which was a launch game for the uh, for the original uh, OG Game Boy that came out in 1989 alongside the Game Boy itself. Now I'm trying to pull up something. I thought I had this ready to go, but it turns out I forgot to open it up. I just wanted to. Where's the back of? I don't have. Let's see. I'm looking for the. I swear I had the back cover of this game open. You know what? I'll just have to open it up in. Okay. Alleyway. I just want to read the back of this the the game box here. Um, the, the strange thing about all these breakout type games, a lot of them had this weird urge to contextualize the game somehow. And this one, they tried to do it by having it, the idea that Mario was piloting a spaceship. So in the back of the box says, enter stellar ping pong with a deadly energy ball. Your spaceship is at the gate of the alleyway. Use your vessel to repel the energy ball. Atomize space grids with your return shots. Destroy the entire field and move on to even more challenging targets. You're in command of the alleyway. So, uh, hey, thanks everyone who's, uh, hey, Turbo Graphics, I see you there. Hey, Kalaka boy. Uh, yeah, I do Wednesday streams, uh, intermittently. Um, if you look on the about page on my, um, on my Twitter, on my, oh, excuse me, on my Twitch page, you can see the currently scheduled, uh, streams. So sometimes I stream on Wednesday, sometimes I don't. But uh, we're gonna be trying to collect some uh, some high score data uh, for this game, so uh, let's uh, jump right into it. Now uh, I now I'm playing with the analog pocket. The analog pocket console itself has all kinds of different cool filters and special settings to make the screen uh, simulate different models of Game Boy that all have different looks uh, screen uh, different looks to the screen. Uh, unfortunately, none of those features are available in docked mode as of yet. Future firmware and console updates for the Analog Pocket may allow you to access those features when docked. But what I did was I literally just added a green JPEG over my layout here, and I just turned down the trans. I turned on a transparency effect so that when filtered through here, it looks kind of like I'm playing on an original Game Boy with the green uh, screen uh, filter on it. So, uh, so Turbo Graphics, the frame rate is not so hot on Switch. I know Pete Dory loves to make his uh, cracks at the Switch for all its uh, upsides. It, a lot of games tend to chug on it if they're not especially optimized. Uh, yeah, here we're just in the, uh, yeah, this is literally just a green JPEG that I turned down the opacity on. So I have my on-screen um, stats, sort of like how I did when I was doing my high score runs of versus pinball. So we'll start the timer. And jump right into it. Now, if, uh, if you need me to, uh, there's not a lot of sound or music in this game, which is one of the criticisms it, it got, perhaps rightfully so. And this is a very this is co-developed by Nintendo R&D One and Intelligent Systems. We're gonna let this play out because this is basically the only music in the entire game. So the 200 there, that's the default, that's the default high score. I'm playing with the, uh, the 8-bit Doe, uh, gamepad, uh, the Super NES style one. I'm using the USB mode, just because I found that to be the most reliable option. I have a longer, I found a longer, uh, USB, uh, C cable than I had before. Now, uh, the, when the game ends, it automatically jumps back to the title screen. Uh, so I have to remember, like with pinball, I have to remember to col to take down my score before the game um, resets back to the tile screen. And I am going to be collecting my scores to form an average. And one thing I want to do, if, I'm going to come back to this periodically. Uh, I don't have an average yet because I don't really have much of a pool to draw from. But eventually I'm going to do a series of runs where I play entirely using the um, my broadcast. Because right now I'm looking at a separate monitor. So I'm looking at it in real time. 
But on my broadcast software, I can look over it. There's like a millisecond delay of a couple of milliseconds. It's just enough. It's good enough that I can play it, but just enough of a delay that it's noticeable in the controls where I feel the lag. And I'm going to play like that for a, like, you know, a good ten or a good several sessions and, and take an average and see how much my score uh, decreases my average compared to when I'm playing in real time. Now, um, this is nostalgic for me, but not nostalgic in the sense of back in the day. I, uh, had, I did play Game Boy back, I had got my Game Boy in 95, that was before Game Boy Pocket, this was back in the original model Game Boy, before I think even the Play It Loud Game Boys were on the market. And, so I played back when the original model Game Boy was, you know, the, you know, the latest Nintendo handheld out, out there. But I did not hear of this game until the day that the that Game Boy that the Nintendo eShop opened up on the 3DS Virtual Console. And I remember that day it was the Nintendo dropped their eShop the day for their eShop their update that added the eShop to the 3DS. They added that the same day that they added um, that uh, this it was the same day of their their E3 2011 uh, uh, presentation. So it was going to be a big news day for Nintendo. I guess they wanted to have as much positive news about themselves as possible. Oh, Nintendo does this big update to the 3DS. They had Virtual Console for the first time ever to a handheld. And it was the first time they ever re-released a lot of any of these Game Boy games in digital form. And they, a couple of the games they released were Super Mario Land, which is the first Game Boy game I tried back in 95 when I got my Game Boy, and Alleyway, which I never even heard of. And this is... And in 2011, just a few years before in 2007 or so, I got back into Game Boy because I got a Game Boy Pocket and I went and rebought, repurchased some of my oh, Game Boy original Game Boy games that I had sold or that I had lost track of over the years. And I was cruising around on campus, you know, with my, my Game Boy Pocket like a dork back before that was, I, I guess, a cool thing to do, so to speak. Um... I mean, arguably, it still isn't now, but it's more of a mainstream thing than it was uh, at back then, certainly. Uh, so, I remember, because what I would always do for Nintendo's E3 presentation was I would uh, I would go into the city. I'd take, it was like an hour-long train ride into the city, and I'd watch the Nintendo E3 presentation. They'd have a sort of one-day Nintendo con, so to speak, at the Nintendo World Store, where a bunch of fans would get together in the store and watch the uh, the press conference live, you know, on a big screen. So it was the next best thing to actually being there. And it was always a big event, getting up early in the morning and uh, going into the store, uh, going into on the train into the city and uh, waiting in front of the store for the doors to open and for us to go into and see the, uh, the the presentation, see whatever big Nintendo news they had coming out. And plus it was E3 in general. And so it was always exciting seeing what PlayStation and Xbox were coming out with as well. So my nostalgia for this game is actually exper discovering, the shock of discovering that there was an... A, a Nintendo published launch game for Game Boy I'd never even heard of and I mean in, just a few years before in 2007 when I was getting it when I was sort of rediscovering Game Boy I was buying some early uh, Game Boy games that I hadn't experienced back then I just discovered then that there was Balloon Kid a Game Boy exclusive sequel to Balloon Fight that was an actual proper uh, full-fledged platformer that I'd never heard of so I was going out of my way to discover early Game Boy games that I may not have heard of and discover to find out that there was a, a Nintendo published breakout clone where Mario was the paddle and I never heard of it. Now I remember reading and I think it was in an Awada ass or something like that. Some of the someone or some a couple of people that were working with Gunpei Yokoi uh, to develop the Game Boy and apparently Gunpoi's uh, Gunpei early uh, concept for the Game Boy was it to be sort of a a, a souped-up Game & Watch. And it was some of the younger people on the development team who convinced him to do something a little more ambitious rather than be a toy that would maybe last for a couple of years. It would be a full-fledged system that might even get third-party support. Because apparently the initial concept for Game Boy wasn't even that ambitious. It was more of a more direct expansion of the Game Boy. And I wonder if perhaps this game in particular might have even been some sort of a holdover from that earlier concept for what Game Boy could be. 
Now, when this game came out on the 3DS Virtual Console, a lot of uh, the reviews for it and the impressions of it from people who just downloaded it not really knowing much about it were very harsh on this game. I feel a bit unfairly so. Because even if you compare this to... I mean, I think they were unfairly harsh, perhaps, yet I can understand why they would be harsh, because if you compare this even to something like Super Mario Land... I mean, compared to Super Mario Land 2, Super Mario Land was very primitive and, uh, and conservative, but if you look... Uh, if you look at this as something where you're developing this from the, almost as... Like, is this just going to be a game and watch with interchangeable cartridges, or is this going to be a full-fledged proper system? What's kind of interesting is that this there is no equivalent to this on the NES. Uh, there was a standalone console called... Uh, back when Nintendo was doing those standalone systems, like, like the TV Game 6, T TV Game 15... I think there was a game, an, a racing game called Highway 112 or something like that. And a few other standalone Pong system type units. Um, and Nintendo actually released a standalone unit in Japan only called Block Kazushi. Which I believe basically just translates to brick breaking or block breaking. And uh, in Japan, this game was actually called alleyway with the the english word alleyway with the subtitle in japanese block kazushi so in japan nintendo was kind of drawing this link between their between this title and their earlier about a, maybe a decade earlier at this point their earlier block kazushi standalone tv uh home game and I love it's so satisfying when you get the block up in that that uh that gutter. Well, I guess the alleyway you could call it. I guess that's the concept of getting the ball stuck in between the uh, array of brick targets and the upper edge of the court. I guess is where the concept of the word alleyway even came from. Now, uh, starting from stage four, how this goes? There's going to be one stage. That's just a static array of bricks. Then there's a second stage where the where the bricks are moving. Then there's a third stage where the bricks are moving gradually towards you. Then the fourth stage, uh, the no, the second, you know, the, then the third stage is going to be a bonus stage where you're trying to clear out a bunch of bricks, but the brick the ball passes through them this time. You're trying to clear them in a time limit, and there's no penalty. It's a, you're on time limit, and it's basically a bonus stage where there's no consequence for losing the ball. Starting from stage four, and this is a... I never actually played the original breakout, believe it or not. Uh, starting from this stage forward, if your ball hits the upper edge of the court, your paddle is reduced in size by half. I never liked that. I, and then first off, I can understand that more on a coin-operated unit. But we lost our first brick of the our first ball of the game. I can understand that more in a in a coin in a in a coin operated arcade unit where you're trying to take quarters, right? But here you already sold the game. Why make the game that much harder? And it's I feel like the back of the court is the legitimate part of the play field. It's not like you're cheating. It's not like you hit a foul. So I feel like punishing you by reducing the size of the the paddle in half is really unreasonable but that's the way they programmed it so that's those are the rules we got to play by yeah yeah turbo graphics it's like of honestly of all the people on twitch you're like one of the only people that i could have like an informed discussion of the mechanics of a game of this type <laughs> And this is, like, I mean, Breakout is such an interesting game just because it's almost like, okay, you have Pong, but the only problem with Pong is you need a second player, and if you don't really have the quite the AI to program in a second paddle that could play, that could provide a challenging uh, gameplay against a single opponent, against a human opponent, having you just break out bricks is uh, probably the most logical solution you could come up with 
without being able to program in a paddle that can play well with a, with a human player. So it, it solves a pretty basic problem with the, such basic um, hardware. Now, I've never read any interviews with the creators of Breakout. I don't know if that's what they were going for, but I think that's what ended up... I think that's how they ended up coming up with the concept for Breakout. And there's so many different ways they contextualize Breakout. Because the idea of Breakout is that you're like a prisoner that's trying to break out of prison. I've seen all kinds of science fiction explanations for trying to come up with a storyline or context for why you're this paddle. Now, one thing I'd love to do, now this is, I'd love, being a kid from the 90s who had both Game Boy and Game Gear and appreciated both of their benefits and downsides, I want to do some side-by-side, -side, I haven't scheduled, I haven't booked, you know, I haven't booked any of these kinds of streams yet, but I'd like to do some side-by-side games one thing i mean the most obvious one i'd like to go for i haven't done standalone super mario land yet but it would be fun to have standalone no i mean just like side by side like you know two hours of super mario land on game boy then two hours of sonic the hedgehog on game gear that would be a fun head-to-head -head stream and then in between watch some commercials you know for the you know some early generation game boy and game gear commercials and maybe read. Uh, that would be. Uh, that would, I think it would be a fun theme for a stream. I don't know if this that's ever really been done before. One thing I w I will say is that right now, I am what the only coverage whatsoever of uh, alleyway on Twitch. There's no recordings. There are no vods. There are no uploads of alleyway. If you look in the alleyway category, which I do not. I'm not streaming in the alleyway category because it's so like sparse that it's i feel like it's almost not even worth like streaming it in like no one i think like 77 people on all of twitch me being one of them even follow the alleyway category and then that once in a blue moon i see someone streaming under alleyway it's usually some other game that for some reason some random game that for some reason i can't understand they're streaming under alleyway or that um it's a stream that just happens to have the name Alleyway in its title, but has nothing to do with the Alleyway game. Now, uh, most of the behind-the-scenes info, like the fact that this was developed, uh, well, we believed it was developed by Intelligent Systems, that is not something we know from the game itself. It's something we know from listings on Intelligent Systems' website and their own uh, company history. I'm going to pause and... Uh... Now it's funny, I look over to my layout and I forget that I have that filter up to make it look like I'm playing on the, uh, on the original OG Brick Game Boy. <laughs> yeah, it's very, uh, me, I'm just seeing it, you know, just plainly displayed, you know, and I guess plainly just straight out the system. But for everyone watching, I have that filter up, which is genuinely, I, all I did was put up a, it's just a JPEG, a green JPEG that I overlaid onto my layout and put and uh, turn down the opacity on it so that you could see through it partially. I had to c try a couple of shades of green to get to get it to look right. And then I had to mess with the, the different, um, I guess, settings in which you could alter the opacity with the filter. But I got it to work out manually. And uh, if, it's, if uh, Analog never uh, updates the Game Boy, I mean, the uh, their... Their firmware on the the dock and the console to display those special filters. One thing I think is really crazy, Turbo Graphics. I don't know if I mentioned this or if you know about it, but there is a mode on the Analog Pocket that lets you display the game on Game Bo on original like black and white Game Boy games. It lets you display the games as though it's being viewed on the on the as though you're looking at it on the red and black filter like the red and black like lcd like led screen on a pinball's high screen machine like you know those old pinball games you know what i'm talking about where it'll either be the orange leds or i don't know if that's led or lcd it'll be the orange matrix display or the red matrix display you can display it as though you're playing a game boy game on the high score display of a pinball machine and it is the craziest thing i don't know why they included it I mean, it looks cool as heck on an action. When you're looking at it on the console unit, it looks cool as heck. But there is no... I don't know why you do it. And the only reason I don't use it is 
basically for practical purposes it makes it look like you're as though these Game Boy games were released on Virtual Boy but the only reason I don't use it is because uh, you, using the display that lets you see it on the Game Boy like green screen filter is just so nostalgic for me that I'd rather use that instead yeah yeah the, yeah, the DMD yeah, and the way they the, the filter is called the Neon Matrix Pinball, and out of like I'm not, I don't think enough like I'm not an, I don't work enough with actual pinball tables to think, I don't I don't see those words. That's almost like word salad to me. And then I was playing it for a few minutes, and then actually what made it click was I well, I was visiting my mom over um uh, over the um over the holiday season. And me and my mom went to this, uh, this, uh, certain, uh, certain, uh, comic shop. And they have a little arcade in the back with a bunch of pinball tables. I'm like, okay, this is not an opportunity to get off and to actually play some physical pinball tables. Uh, let me play it. And then I, I'm like, oh, that's what they mean by neon matrix pinball. Like, because I don't think like that. So, like, when I actually saw it in person, like the high score display, I'm like, oh, yes, of course. That actually shows, you know, what what mode it's in, what what targets are active. That's when I realized what they were getting at by calling that filter by that name. And by the way, uh, if my audio on my microphone starts going bananas, it, starts, it sounds like I am have like the filter, like a robot filter or something on my voice. I've had some weird problems the previous stream where after every like 20 or 30 minutes it would just start acting up like that and I'd have to unplug the mic and replug it in. I'm using a different USB cable. In fact, the USB cable I was using then for my microphone is now the one I'm using to plug to play to plug my uh, my gamepad into because I have my gamepad physically plugged into the uh, the analog dock. And uh so, and uh, one thing, uh, the, the two things, the main, two main things I want out of the analog pocket that are not already on there. So this is the bonus stage. So we're, uh, we're not in any, uh, oh yeah, and in these stages you do not, if your ball hits the back of the court, you, your, your paddle doesn't change, uh, size. Now it's weird, it's weirdly easy to get into this funk where you just keep hitting the same things over and over. Now this uses a lot of Mario motifs and enemies uh, for the uh, for the uh, targets in these bonus stages, and the use of Mario with the paddle showing him jumping into the into the paddle at the beginning of the game. This was back before there were a bunch of strict like style guide use stuff for Mario. It wasn't strictly regulated. Like, if any one at Nintendo, like, oh yeah, let's put Mario as the bonus in NES Pinball, you just throw him in there. If you want to have Mario be the ref, oh, this is my this is my favorite stage of the game. This is one of my favorite stages. This is one of my favorite stages right here. This is so much fun. Okay, here we go. Oh no, this isn't it. Never mind. Well, this is a fun stage, but there's a version of the stage. I think it's I guess it's in the next set of stages. Where the it's this layout, but the the grid is scrolling, and each layer of bricks is moving at a different rate of speed. So if you get the ball like crammed in there, you could just spend the rest of the round just letting the ball ricochet and watching it. I mean, it, it's reasonable. I mean, the critics. I like how basic this game is. I like how simple this is, honestly. But, uh, given Super Mario Land, right, y y it's reasonable to expect there to have been, uh, you know, just a, even a, a single basic background track for this stage, for these, for the gameplay stages. Now, most of my, uh, actually, this is, pl most of my uh, playtime with this game is actually spent on the 3DS Virtual Console. I only got this game a couple of years. I got this game not long after I pre I did my in 2019 when I initially pre-ordered the Analog Pocket. I got this game in preparation to eventually stream it. But um, no, well, yeah, it was 2019 when I, man, is that long ago? I think it was 2019 when I yeah, it was it was long ago. That's that's the point. But I. I got the, uh, that's when I purchased the actual cartridge for this. 
in preparation to eventually stream it. Now, most of my sessions, be it on the 3DS Virtual Console or the couple of... I only play this on my Game Boy Pocket a couple of times, actually. Usually my play sessions sort of end when whatever I'm sitting around waiting for. And this is one of my this is one of my go-to games on my uh, on my 3DS. This is probably one of my top five, if not t top ten, if not top five, most played games on my 3DS. Thanks to the activity tracker, I could track how much time I played with certain games, all my different games. Because this is a great game. If I don't have, I mean, you could always just close the lid on the 3DS at any time. But if I'm ever was somewhere and I knew it was knew I was only had a couple minutes to play. This is one of those great games I could just pop open at any time, regardless of what game cards I have with me, and just play for a few minutes. Most of my time, I've never spent sat down and sat and grinded for hours for high scores at this game. Honestly, most of my game my lost balls are probably just due to getting to this awkward moment where there's only one. This is kind of like. And Space Invaders. When you've got that one ship left and it's just that single target and it's just so tricky just not dying. You're just, uh, this isn't quite that tricky. This is basically just me playing solitaire at this point. It's me playing like uh, squat. It's me playing paddle ball against a wall. Uh, just trying not to die until eventually my ball coincidentally hits that very last brick. That's And most of my lost balls, frankly, Frankly, you're gonna probably be in this last phase of a stage. I'm just waiting to, uh... Okay, here we go, baby. Here we go. This is the fun stage. Okay, now, what do I want to... Hmm. Alright, this is the, my favorite stage. Here we go, here we go, here we go. No, no. And if you don't get it in... If you don't manage to get... To, to get it wedged in there quickly... The more... Oh, 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 I'm easily amused. Okay. <laughs> oh, no. Almost, 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 almost. Come on, come on. Yeah, there we go, there we go. There we go. That was, got a little, a little, uh, satisfaction out of that. Oh. <laughs> Oh man, okay. Yeah, that's such a... I think I do... In fact, in the 3DS, I think I have a say, like a, a restore point on this particular stage just so I could re replay this particular stage over and over. Like, I wonder how long I have to play. The only reason... The only time I ever saw someone like just actually... like caught someone live playing this particular game. It was someone who was, I think it's uh, RetroArch has some sort of achievements thing you could built into it or that you could add to it where you could play old games and it could detect what game you're playing and actually like as though you're playing a modern game with achievements, uh, register those achievements live in real time and display them on screen. Like I'll get so many points in a certain game or do different challenges or meet certain conditions. Oh, thank you, uh, Turbo Graphics. I think that he was just going for achievements, and not that there's anything wrong with that. Anything that gets anyone to play this no frills game, this primitive no frills game, I'm totally down for. However, um, I think that um, that was the only reason they're playing it, and they're just going for it, getting as many achievements as possible. And that's the only reason time I ever caught someone live playing this particular title. And another thing is like I, super. I'm subscribed to. Uh, I'm this. I'm on this. I'm subscribed to the Super Mario Land channel, and pretty much uh, here on Twitch, and like nine, like ninety percent or more of the time, whenever I see someone live playing Super Mario Land, it is usually a non-English speaking streamer. And I, it's usually someone from Europe. It's either Germany or France or Portugal. And I don't know why. I find that very interesting that particularly European gamers would be the ones to stream on the Super Mario Land category. Now, I wonder if 
more of the people who stream Super Mario Land tend to be English speakers, and English speakers tend to stream that under Retro instead of under Super Mario Land. Because the, the more obscure of a category a game has, the more benefit you get out of just streaming probably under Retro and hoping, hoping to get randomly discovered or clicked on as opposed to just um, trying to stream under an obscure category and hoping someone with an interest in that particular niche title comes along and clicks on your stream. Like with Super... Like, with Sonic the Hedgehog on Master System, well, the 8-bit Sonic the Hedgehog, particularly on Game Gear, well, first off, there's no particular category for that game, the 8-bit version of Sonic the Hedgehog, be it the Master System or Game Gear version. So, I stream that just under Sonic the Hedgehog, which, which is intended, I think, to mean the Genesis version. But when I see people streaming, like, when if I type in Sonic the Hedgehog Master System, uh, usually, like, 99% of the time, it's a European streamer, particularly mainland Europe, and often a non-English speaker. Or if they're English speaker, they're usually from the UK. Uh, that I can specifically understand, because Master System had more of a following in that part, in, uh, non-English speaking countries than it ever did in North America. And then on top of that, now here it's kind of, this isn't... It's a bit of a Space Invaders kind of thing here, where the uh, the array of, of targets is approaching me rapidly. Uh, actually, I think it stops at this point. But uh, I don't lose points. I don't... I'm not at hazard of... Well, I guess as the, the closer the array gets to me, the more... Less time I have to respond to get to... Uh, to bounce the ball back up there safely. But I... At a certain point, the, the targets despawn. And... At that point, I'm not, I don't lose points, but however, I lose the opportunity to earn those points. So I, it is in my interest to get those, um, to get those targets, um, uh, to knock out as many targets as I can before they despawn. At this point, the bricks don't continue to advance. If they did, I guess, I, I, I believe at some point, uh, or uh, at some point, I remember somehow ending up in a situation where the last brick um, despawned by advancing. I guess the last... You know what? I know what happened. Because it, uh, because it, uh, in a sense, it almost seemed like that should be impossible. What happened was the last brick was high enough in an earlier stage that it wasn't past like this point where they no longer will, will continue to advance. And it despawned by scrolling towards me, and at that point, the stage will instantly end. Now, I'm at my last ball. I don't think I have any more... Oh, shucks. 20... 27, 26. Now, 27, 26. Now, that is not particularly important to remember this time around, since that is happens to be the high score. 27, 26. So I want to put that into my... My spreadsheet. Actually, it's not a spreadsheet. It's just a document. Now I'm gonna put that in. I don't. Now I'm not going to enter that into. Okay. My high score 27, 26. My stream PB 27, 26. Now I actually have this open. In um, in GIMP, my the uh sort of free Photoshop alternative, and the reason I have it that that window open there with my score stuff is because if I, tr I used to try to t I used to type this stuff out within I used to type this stuff out excuse me I just want to click off of that okay there we go I used to type that stuff within my broadcast software but the lag just typing in just basic text stuff is just so low that I'm like it's easier for me to open up a new window and we'll open up a different program that just displays the text somehow or another that I could go into and alter that on the fly. Because if I was trying to do that within Streamlabs, it would just take forever. On my old computer, it didn't take long to, uh, to, to make edits like that. And this one, it does. So we're just going to uh, continue. All right. So, uh, round two. Now, I I do wish it just would give you... I wish that it didn't go back to the... Cycle back to the title screen. Oh, yeah, we got Alleyway the first, um... First couple of, uh, volleys. Yeah, the... So, basically, uh, the scoring is pretty simple. 
uh, one brick equals one point. Uh, up until the, well, the, with the first three stages, you know each brick, you know, okay, I know exactly, I've cleared 94 bricks so far. Well, actually, it's true that, um, in, uh, the bonus stage, it's also one point per brick. But if you 100% the bonus stage, which I've never done organically, the only time I ever 100%ed the bonus stage. Actually, I did it once, um, since I got the analog pocket, because occasionally when I'd go to, uh, to IHOP or something like that, which I'd go to IHOP at like 5.30 in the morning like a dork when no one's there, um, so it's not crowded or anything. Um, when I'd go there for that, I would, um, well, I'd... Well, one of my main 3DS playing times is when I'd go to uh, IHOP or whatever, which, you know, when I'm waiting for the food to come. And uh, I was, you know, I'd just play 3DS, or nowadays uh, my analog pocket, while I wait for the uh, the food to come. Uh, one of those times I accidentally, without even meaning to, I well, I mean, I meant to, but I wasn't particularly aiming for it. Because there are some times when I'm playing the bonus stage, and I'm thinking, all right, I'm going to clear this bonus stage. I'm going to go for it. I'm going to go for it. I wasn't thinking like that, and I guess I just got in the zone. Oh, and ended up uh, clearing the bonus stage. And you'd get a bunch of bonus points for clearing, the, uh, completely clearing the bonus stage. But as long... So, shy of... Um, unless you clear the bonus stage, which is not a bad thing to happen. The cl one nice thing is that you can very specifically know, okay, I've cleared like 2,000 or 4,000 or whatever number of blocks so far. It's just nice when there's, because a lot of games, well, some games might have a system where it's like, oh, each block is like 10 points or each block is 50 or 100 points. It's very nice to have a very concrete sort of scoring system where I know, okay, 229 points or 232 when counting points means I've cleared that many blocks throughout this game. <laughs> so I'd like to, uh, to congratulate everyone. No, because a lot of streamers, and there's nothing wrong with this approach, it's just not the way I do it. If we're a game like this, or even in a game that has proper music, like if you people who might play like Sonic the Hedgehog or something, going, grinding for, um, high speed, um, for high score runs, might play some of their own random, their own personal music that they like to listen to in the background. I don't, that hasn't been my style. I like to, uh, just let whatever music is or isn't in the original game, the sound effects just be the, what carries the stream. I like to sort of recreate the ambiance of the game. So if a game like this just has basic beeps and boops and not much in terms of actual music, I just like to leave it that way. I know one thing I like to do for my commit for my DOS streams that I've done, only in the last three or four DOS streams, which is actually probably accounts for 50% of my DOS streams, like, since I started streaming, is that I have, I, uh, LGR, um, who does a lot of tech stuff on, uh, YouTube, a lot of old computer, you know, 80s, 90s, uh, computing stuff, with a lot of emphasis on, uh, DOS, uh, uh, you know, types of computers that would natively run DOS or uh, Windows 95 or 98 as their operating system. He recorded a soundtrack that's nothing but just sounds that he recorded of his old one of his old DOS machines just running and whirring, the, fa the cooling fan running, it, like the disk drive clicking and clacking. And I uh, use that as the, the backdrop for... When I play Commander Keen uh, and and Helios, which I do via uh, DOSBox X, my emulator that I use with my PC, to sort of add to the, um, I guess, the period feel of it, where it's like, yes, these games didn't have much in terms of sound, just basic uh, PC speaker, or I used to call it the bell speaker, because on like the Apple II, if you, I think it would if you hit like Command G or some some button with the G on the older model Apple IIs. They would actually, the keyboard would be laid out like a teletype keyboard, where you just had a sort of a, a non, a unit with no computer, computing power of its own that would, could be used to spend, send telex type messages from a, from a, uh, you know, just through a telex service. And one thing you do to cue the operator on the other end, bonus stage time, to cue the operator on the other end that you are ready to send or receive, I think, they had what they called a bell key that was attached to G, 
So the G key on a lot of those older computers that were emulating or simulating a do a t that could be used as a telex uh, keyboard or a, t a teletype keyboard, I guess, would have the the word bell written over the G for that basic you know beep and make a beep sound come out over your Apple II. So I would actually um, just call that basic PC speaker a bell speaker, but I don't think I've ever heard anyone else use that term. And the, the machines that I remember having that bell speaker on them, where we actually had in my, in my elementary school, we had some of the black, what they call the Darth Vader Bell and Howell model Apple IIs. Now, some of the early, I guess Apple was concerned that a lot of, uh, the idea of having a computer in a school setting was a new idea. And Bell and Howell was already an established brand and produced a lot of equipment like, like overhead projectors, and uh, slide, uh, carousel slide displays, and uh, transparency displays to have a, you know, a transparency sheet that you use to demonstrate a math problem for the class in a darkened classroom setting. And Bell and Howell made a lot of gear like that. So I guess uh, Apple had a, a deal with Bell and Howell to have some black, which because all of Bell and Howell's stuff was, I guess, that black color. This is very embarrassing to lose a ball this early in the, uh, in the game. But uh, we gotta have those variances to have a good set of uh, data, right? Um, they would have a these black Apple IIs with a black keyboard, and they were early enough in that Apple II uh, product lifespan that they were still had those the keyboards labeled like a teletype keyboard, and it would have the word bell written over the G. And I just remember as a kid that, like, oh, if you hit option G or whatever combo it was, you could make the, make the computer beep and annoy the, uh, the instructor. <laughs> uh, so I never knew, I didn't know what a teletype machine was or that it was em emulating a pre-computer keyboard. But I just knew that it would said bell and you could press a certain button to make the computer beep. Uh, yeah, so that's... Uh, a conversation that makes me sound a lot older than I actually am. Uh, but, um, uh, yeah, so that's my, um, my memories of, um, why I, why I call up what they often call a PC speaker. That's why I call it, I tended to call it a, man, I, I lost again. Lost another ball already. So, will this be, so we're going to get a good set of data here. And we're going to be able to tell. If this is going to be an, if like the last game, is that, was that an above average score or is this going to be a, you know what? And my scores, if I ever get a perfect bonus stage, I'm going to put a B next to that score on my spreadsheet so that I could specifically tell if that was an above average performance game in general or if I happened to get a bonus because the bonus I think gives you so many points. I think it gives you like 500 or a thousand points or something ridiculous like that. Where out of context, it would make it sound like I got maybe four or five stages ahead of a typical game. And uh, one thing, I'm I'm such a dork. I want to do, uh, so if I ever get a score like that, and actually I want to do, I can run this on my uh, my Game Boy, um, excuse me, on my uh, my 3DS Virtual Console where I have the stage states. I could do a, I could use, um, I could use uh, my my restore point function to force a bonus, um, to force my, to, uh, use save states basically to win a bonus round and calc and know exactly how many bonus points you get for winning that bonus round. So at any point I can plug in a simulated bonus game by just adding in an extra 500 or a thousand or whatever points and just plugging that into a box, a box and whisker chart to see how much a winning a bonus round will skew or getting a perfect match in my bonus round hey mecha kong i'm doing very well um the seems like the stream is going well on a technical level so far this is our second game of the session and wow almost only 20 minutes shy of being an hour in to the stream and we've only this is only our second run which is pretty pretty cool um, certainly a lot longer than some of my pinball sessions have lasted. We've only have one game, uh, sample data so far. Um, I don't have any preview. All the data you will be seeing is going to be data that's 100% from, uh, playing live on stream. So that way, 
I think that's cool because I could, you know, theoretically, if oh, I could include my high score for my 3DS uh, virtual console uh, uh, alleyway data. But this way, I know all these scores are from me playing and streaming and talking live. So I know they're all played under fairly similar conditions. But what I was talking about is how once I figure out exactly how many points you get for getting a perfect, you get a bunch of bonus. Basically, the scoring for this is one brick cleared equals one point. But if you clear a bonus round perfectly, you get like 500 or 1,000 extra points, which makes it could make it seem like you got, like I got a, you know, four or five stages extra ahead of a typical game. And, I, and once I know how many bonus points that is, I could just plug those in, you know, just theoretically and see like how many more points that adds, how much that skews my average, and how much that skews a box and whisker chart. And a box and whisker chart is something that was made by a mathematician called uh, John Tukey, who was really interested, he was a mathematician who was interested in seeing, uh, being able to visualize how an outlier in a set of data uh, will skew your average in a set of results. So like if you're doing, if you're take seeing like, oh, what's the average home value in a given neighborhood, right? And you have a typical like middle class like neighborhood, but then there's this one house that happens to uh, like a millionaire decided to move in and build their house there and build the super nice house that's like above and beyond what anyone in that, in that neighborhood could afford. Now, if you include that in your average, all of a sudden you're going to have this one household that's going to skew up the the average like property value of or the prop or the average income let's say of all that of that entire neighborhood but if you plot if you use a, a box and whisker chart and visualize that data you can see that there's one particular uh, like data and like piece of data that's skewing all of that data way higher up so that you can know like okay we know that one piece of data is an outlier another example if you're if you have a if you're taking if you have a, like a, a a pizza parlor right and you have a pinball machine in the corner and people come in all day and play the pinball machine that's usually adults playing let's say uh, some guy comes in with his uh, kid and you know they he holds the kid up and oh yeah you can play and holds the kid up so that they can play pinball you know <laughs> I have that image of the, the the parent and the the dad in the Walmart holding their kid up to the security cameras so they can see themselves on the TV. And, um, hey, Barface, uh, thanks for the, uh, the host. Uh, so they, the parent comes in, they pull up a stool and sit their kid on it so the kid could play pinball. Now, the kid, he's having fun. He can't really play that well. He's just having fun bouncing the ball around. So that kid isn't very talented, so they're going to get a significantly below average score compared to all the adult players that are typically playing. So if you look at all the data, all these da these sessions, all of a sudden you have this one session where, you know, a lot of players are getting, like, points in the thousands, and you have this one particular game that only has a few hundred points. And so that's going to drag that average way down. So um, that... Okay, that, the reason I lost that ball is because I gestured with one hand, even though I don't have this. You only need one hand to play this game. Especially playing with the gamepad, which is much lighter than an original model Game Boy. No problem. Got to warm up later. You'll you'll pop in after. All right. Well, thank you. Um, uh, thanks for dropping in. Thanks for the host. Uh, thanks for showing up. Uh, so you could include that. You could use a box and whisker chart to visualize that one off piece of data. And be like, okay, this isn't. This is dragging the average down. This is an anomalous piece of data, so we should not, if including this, we know is not going to give us an accurate depiction of what the average skill set, uh, what the average skill range of a player is going to be. And I say this now. You know, this whole conversation just right now. Will you, will you believe that my freaking college had the nerve to try to argue that I was mathematically illiterate? And held me back for, for years for getting my bachelor's degree, saying that I I was mathematically illiterate and couldn't function in a freaking math class. Well, yes, it's I mean yes, it's true. I cannot function in a typical math class that a you know a typical student would be able to. But I, <laughs> but um, but I mean, meanwhile, the the, uh, the head of the English department, I mean, the math department, for years had no idea this was happening to me. 
And when they, they eventually, uh, uh, when he got involved and agreed to do an independent study with me, he's like, listen, what you're doing with me in this independent study is above and beyond what, a, what I would expect from a typical math student. And it's outrageous that they were holding your degree for this long just because you couldn't, like, pass a typical math class of just regurgitating problems uh, from a textbook. All right. All right. So, 1484. Okay, so we're just going to punch that in to our spreadsheet. Hold on. 1484. So we're gonna punch that into um, our on-screen high score. Uh, no, no. Actually, no. I guess I don't have to change anything because neither my high score nor the unless I. Actually, I'm gonna change. I'm gonna add to this. No, I'll just call it recent. One, four, eighty-four. Hey, Kalaka boy. All right, let's see what let's see what you're having for lunch. You're having a deli selected. No, no, I love how specific you are. Deli selected honey uncured ham with Swiss cheese wrap. Man, you you need, yeah, you're really selling this wrap. You know, like if uh, if you uh, were trying to uh, plug a uh, delivery service that could bring this wrap to viewers, you know, you're certainly. Uh, now let's see. No, no, no. We want to. Okay, we're gonna. No, what, what we want to do. I just have to go to. Again. Okay, we're gonna expand. We're gonna stretch this up a bit. And we're gonna move this. Is this? No, no, no. No, no, no. That's that's. I have to figure out, I have to, so I have to mess around with the size, okay, there we go, that's how we do it. I just have to finagle around with, and make sure, get this to line up with the window capture, extreme PD, average, okay. Okay, and now I just have to close, shut the door, yeah. And now I can just drag this up. Come on. Here we go. There we go. That's what I like to see. And we're just going to lock that bad boy in. There we go. Actually, why don't I... I want to... So I don't have an on-screen alert for hosting. Let's. I'm gonna replay the latest follow. Let's see. All right. There's like a long delay when I. All right. Why well, don't I need my alerts are way. Hold on. I have to move my alert. There we go. It's way far. It's way in the back of my layout. And if let me try that again, because no one's gonna see the pretty doorworm art by my. Uh, let's refresh that. And make sure it actually this. Is okay. And I'm gonna refresh. I just wanna. Come on. There we go. By my uh, artist uh, pal, uh, Kita Space Cat. Very hard worker. Does most of the art for my stream. Um, okay, now let's continue with the next round. Alright. Alright, so we... Okay, so we're about a quarter of the way through the stream at this point. Alright. Yeah, alleyway, let's go. 
Man, whenever it seems like with this basic arrangement, I typically tend to shoot it up one side and it goes straight down the other. Ideally, you want it to get in that gutter and just like and bounce back and forth off the back of the court. Like, uh, repeatedly. I, I mean, can you believe I've already, we've already cleared 50, 52, 58 and counting of these bricks. And it just, it just add tallies up so quickly. And I am, as always, I mean, I don't always say how flattered and honored I am at the number of viewers I get. But it's like, especially with this, because there is not a lot to look at. There's not a lot to listen to. <laughs> but I do know for sure. Oh yeah, that's I, that's a thought. Well, two thoughts I I wanted to mention earlier. Um, if you look up most of what I like, the information on my ticker about this being developed by Intelligent Systems, Intelligent Systems credit does not appear anywhere in this game or on the title screen. It just says copyright Nintendo. If the reason I know this is developed by Int Intelligent Systems is thanks to Jeremy Parrish, who does excellent um, documentary or. I guess sort of coverage, uh, review type things of uh, old video games. This is an epic space drama starring Mario. Well, that's what uh, that's what they want you to th to think. I I guess it's weird how they. Uh, th I've mentioned this earlier in the stream, but there's this weird desire with all these breakout games, going back to the original breakout, of wanting to contextualize with some sort of plot what's going on here. Like the original breakout is like you're a prisoner trying to break out of prison. There's, um, I've seen, like, lots of sci-fi related contexts for this. Yeah, you only see him. He jumps in the paddle at the beginning, and if you look at the box art there, you can see, um, Mario, um, in the controls of the paddle, which is supposed to be a spaceship. I believe the Japanese box art for this, even though this game still features Mario all the same, the Japanese box art just has a generic guy in a astronaut suit, I believe, and not Mario specifically. That's something they added for the U.S. And the, you can see the uh, the flavor text there in the box art. Cruise the alleyway, slam energy balls, and destroy the vid grid. And then the, the I'll read the, the box, uh, the copy on the back of the box later again. But it talks about, like, oh, you're cruising the galactic alleyway or something like that. Okay, I have to uh, crank up my uh, my personal volume a bit. All right. We're at 23 decibels. Let's crank it up to... We're at now at 22.5 decibels. Or neg... It, it, it counts in the negative decibels, so I went from negative to, like... A lower number but it it's actually like increasing the volume so I increased it a bit uh, let me know it's let me know if that's a good uh, volume yeah it'll do the basic level then a scrolling level then a level where the blocks are descending but anyway oh yeah that's what I was thinking the um this guy is YouTube name is he's Jeremy Parrish on YouTube He's been doing for over a decade these excellent reviews on the history of different games on... You'll choose specific systems and then basically go through maybe two or three games at a time on the libraries of each of these systems. And uh, his, his Game Boy series is called Game Boy Works. And he's done an re old review of this game from years ago. And they did a more recent review only a couple of years ago of this title. And he gets into the history of this game. He goes into the the history of the how Nintendo had a standalone uh, a unit of a, this genre of this type of br brick breaking game called Block Kazushi. It's a little better. All right, I'll crank it up a little further. Twenty two point five. How about twenty point negative twenty point five decibels? How does that sound? And if I do need to crank up the uh, the game sound effects to uh, to to coincide with uh, my increase in the in the uh, my mic volume, um, my strategy is my I tend to like I most for the most part for a game like this I know I very specifically all right I just gotta crank up the um my own mic but for a game with the with the with the uh, more music in it I'll tend to mess with the music before I mess with my own mic. I'll only turn down my mic if I know specifically that the mic is too quiet or too loud. But if it's, like, in terms of balance, I'll usually mess with the game audio before I mess with my own mic. 
So, uh, give me an update on how the sound's going. Uh, yeah, so Jeremy Parrish on YouTube, he did a fantastic... If you look up Alleyway Game Boy Works, you'll get, uh, you'll find his reviews. A fantastic professional quality, like, good, good enough for television. Uh, uh, little mini documentaries and all these different games, their contexts. And because he does all the games he reviews in order, he'll talk about the games and the sense of the point at, and the games and the system's lifespan that it came out. <laughs> like, he'll talk about this game like this is one of the first games for Game Boy, as opposed to a later game, he'll talk about, oh, this was at this point, they were more familiar with how the, the Game Boy's capabilities, so they were getting more ambitious, and so forth. Ah. Uh. So here, the, the array is going to start to scroll towards me. And the... Oh, so what was... I was getting at how... Oh yeah, that's what... Uh, yeah, so I was thinking about doing, like, a 90s handheld war streams, perhaps. Like, the first one I want to do is definitely going to be um, uh, Super Mario Land. Like, two hours of Super Mario Land and two hours of, uh, of uh, Sonic the Hedgehog on Game Gear. It'd still be a, a you're now you're saying a lot louder how much loud okay so i'm gonna i'm gonna crank it up a bit 20.5 now we're down to now we're up to 20.5 is that tell me when it's just right and i'm gonna leave it there and if anyone needs to turn down especially with this stream where there's not gonna be much music if you just need to turn down or turn up your volume just go ahead and do so and then I'm going to do some test... I mean, my next stream is going to... Actually, it's really... My next stream is just going to be maybe an hour of this and then three hours of vintage game magazines. Especially about late 80s, early 90s Game Boy stuff. So I, this, the sound balancing isn't going to be that important. It's only going to be important in terms of me being loud enough to hear on people's devices. And if I'm too loud, you can just turn down the, your own personal audio. When, the, when I get into games that have more music again, now it's perfect. All right, I'm going to leave it right here. Uh, but, um, yeah, so Game Boy versus uh, Game Gear. I'm going to have, you know, two hours of Super Mario Land versus two hours of Sonic the Hedgehog on Game Gear. I mean, this was a, that was a matchup. I mean, even more than Sonic, I mean, like Super Mario World on Super Nintendo versus Sonic the Hedgehog on Genesis. That was more of an even matchup. Then Mario La Super Mario Land versus Sonic on Game Gear. It's like a Super Mario Land versus the first Sonic. Like there we go. Like the last block despawn because the, the 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 screen is advancing towards me, and so it just ended right then then and there. Um, it's very easy to get into a funk where you keep retreading the same. You can't you want to get a, a significant enough uh, path change with the trajectory of the ball that you're able to clear a lot of blo blocks in last time. It's easy to get into sort of a deadly cycle or a, a cycle where you're just basically... The ball's retreading a very similar path each time, only getting a couple of balls with each um, volley. Which I'm kind of... It's kind of happening right now. It's a bit uh, destined to happen as you get a more and more... Uh, as there are fewer blocks to clear. Yeah, it's really just... It's really hard to get it down a significantly different path. Okay, we got a few new ones there. So, Super Mario Land. Two hours of Super Mario Land and two, uh, two hours of Sonic on Game Gear. Yeah, that's like that's the easy thing when it's just a, basically a mic-only stream with just minimal sound effects from the game, is that everyone can just turn their own device to be as loud as they want. Whereas if I had a game with more proper music, I, you know, I'd have to do a, little, a bit more of a balancing act in which, once I got my mic that everyone can hear me good, then I'd start finagling with the game audio a bit. Here it's not so important because it's basic basic beeps and boops and it's not as important to hear it. If As long as you can hear that it's there at all, you're pretty much getting the effect, the intended effect, barf face. Um, now, what was it? Uh, man, it's been a while since I've been able to, to, to jump into your stream. Last time you were you were playing, uh, you were playing uh, Warhammer... Uh, uh, 40k Space Marines, right? Um, yeah, so that was... I don't know if you're still playing that these days, but that, yeah, it was. A, I know that was a number of months ago that I was in there. I'm sorry that uh, my schedule doesn't line up as with yours as... Excuse me. What happened? I just lost... I just lost the... Did I just... 
I just lost the control there. I just lost my, uh... Hello. I just lost... Yeah, I just lost... The... I just lost my controller. I did very slightly tap the... Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. You can do it. Don't be shy. Do I have to unplug and replug in? So if I... I'm going to try wireless. Okay. Can I get any kind of... Did the console itself freeze? Hmm. I'm going to lift it off the dock for a moment. All right. All right. Uh, the system... Uh, uh, the game is running fine. I just have to... Okay, so I'm going to plug in the gamepad. Now, this is a wireless gamepad, but I just like the USB connection is more reliable. So I find it odd that it... Okay, so I drop that in the dock. Um... Why is the dock... It's it's still displaying the game. Hmm. Alright. So I'm going to have to re... Did I somehow freeze the dock? I've never heard of that happening. So I'm going to... Actually, I'm going to unplug the dock. I'm going to plug it back in. Let's see that giant hand in the uh, console cam. Okay. So I plugged it. I plugged it in. I'm going to turn the dock on. There's an on button for the dock. It's not like the switch where it's just always on. So now, you know, the system is on. It's unpaused. I'm going to put the dock, the system in the dock. Okay, so it's appeared. Okay, and we've got controller functionality. We only have one Mario. Man, this is going to be a low-scoring game unless I happen to get... I mean, I've, it's happened with pinball where I'm not doing that good, but then somehow on my very last ball, I nail... I like go into the zone and play through like most of the session with just my very last ball. Now, if I get to 1,000 points, I'm going to get an extra ball. All right. And, okay. Now, what was I, what was I talking about? I was talking about you know, the Game Boy versus Game Gear streams. Oh yeah, so I'd like to do Super Mario Land versus Sonic the Hedgehog. And then, what I want to do... Now this is almost like too cruel. Because like, I love Game Boy to death. I love it, like so many fun. Now, in fact, I want to show this off. I could, I had a chance to do so, I just forgot it was there. This bag, this isn't my personal one, but when I got my Game Boy, I also uh, included this... I, this bag, this little shoulder bag thing, it held the Game Gear, I mean the Game Boy, which compared to Game Gear was like, going from Game Gear to Game Boy was like going from Game Boy to Game Boy Pocket. It was like a radically more, much more portable system. So uh, imagine being a kid in the 90s, got the great b brick Game Boy, I've got this little dorky pouch thing, it hold the Game Boy, it hold the battery pack, which I never needed, it hold a bunch of cartridges, it hold your link cable, and it hold the it hold the cartridges and in the little clamshell cases they used to include to keep your cartridges in, or excuse me, game packs is the official Nintendo terminology. I do believe I have it somewhere still, but um, yeah. So I, yeah. So I how I got my Game Boy, my aunt uh worked for a major airline, and in, in the nineties, and when. Uh, when passengers would forget their belongings, they would go into Lost and Found for like, you know, a, a few months or six months or a year, however long it was, 
before the the lost and found items went unclaimed and unclaimed items after a, a very long period of time yet yeah, either like half a year or something like that would become the property of the airline and so the airline would would raffle them off to those items off to employees and lots and my aunt won a few lots one with like a game gear uh, and a, at least a game gear and a couple of games i don't know how many lots these were across these are definitely several because she imagine i just i go to my aunt's place which was like a cross-country flight at the time and there were and i and i knew she had a game boy to give me which was very exciting because i only had game gear at this point no other systems just game gear and a couple of games and at the time you were a hot shot if you had even like half a dozen games for any system of a currently currently on the market system so i had like maybe what did i have before i went to my aunt's on this cross cross country flight it was a very exciting trip you know lots of build up to it especially being a kid at the time had only been on a few flights and this was by far the longest flight I'd ever been on the first flight that was long enough they that they served a proper in-flight meal which is just like a burger and fries or something usually like i've been used to shorter flights that were only like an hour or two they'd give you a pack of peanuts and a juice box or something but they would um so what did I have? My first games I got for my parents got me with my game were Sonic the Hedgehog and Ariton or Ariton, I don't know how exactly to say, uh, Senna's uh, Super Monaco GP2. Uh, no, it was Mortal Kombat, Sonic Mortal Kombat and, uh, and Super Monaco GP2. Then the next, I don't think I got. No, then that, my parents also got me Batman Returns, which I was not very good at. I didn't really quite understand how to play. And then, so I go there. All of a sudden, like, my Game Gear library, like, doubles. I All of a sudden, I have, like, like G-Lock. I had G-Lock, which was a first-person uh, flight game, kind of like Top Gun on NES. Then it was also a side-scrolling uh, shooter of some kind, a side-scrolling space shooter, like a zero-wing, you know, type thing. Zero-wing, life force, those types of games. Then what else was there? There was a... I forgot what else there was, as far as Game Gear. But what I do definitely remember... Oh yeah, also, there was a Shakan the Forever Man for Game Gear. But what was really exciting was Game Boy. Because I got... I was like three or four Game Boys. At, and then I had Super Mario Land 1 and 2, Tetris, Ren and Stimpy, uh, what else? Uh, Ninja Turtles Fall of the Foot Clan, uh, uh, Q, uh, Q Billion, um, which is a strange puzzle game, um, and a few other games. There was like a smorgasbord of games. There was enough games that a, like a year or two later when I wanted to uh, go to Funko Land and uh, trade in for some for some games i had a lot of trade-in fodder i had enough games that i was literally had given away a couple of game boys to um to kids in the neighborhood you know with their parents permission of course and my parents permission who like you know you know maybe or weren't exactly uh, rolling in the dough and really couldn't afford a game system i was able to give game boys away to, to friends I, I had so many doggone game boys and still have enough that i think me my brother and my mom all had game boys too I remember lots of, you know, playing uh, Yoshi for Game Boy with my mom and Tetris using link cables and uh, multiple copies of Tetris in those games. Uh, Yoshi was one of those games I think we got uh, pre-owned from Funko Land. The only original, like, pr g Game Boy game that I ever bought brand new was the original Pokemon Red. And I remember, like, it being such a unique experience. Like, wow, it's a brand new Game Boy game in the box. I remember opening. It was the first time I really took note of the 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 new game smell. It's the only time I ever unboxed a brand new Game Boy game, and actually got to smell the brand new cartridge. See the shine of the light on that, especially with the red cartridge they packed in that shiny red cartridge, and with the shiny new uh, game case. Because when Game Boy Color... I unboxed uh, my first ever Amer American Game Boy Color game on stream when I uh, played Pokemon Trading Card Game uh, during my Analog Pocket sort of uh, uh, variety uh, test streams. And 
I was very disappointed to find that even with the dual mode Game Boy Game Boy Color games, that by that point they had already given up on including those nice little clamshell cases. So, uh, it's the only time I ever got to unbox a brand new Game Boy game and see a brand new, uh, shiny, uh, Game Boy cartridge clamshell case. Oh, shucks. New game smell. I can't say I experienced that much anymore because you opt for digital and used uh, more now. I mean, for modern games, that's a much, especially if you, uh, maybe aren't especially fond of, if you like, I, like, for something like, say, Pokemon Sword, um, where, okay, I know this, me personally, I was not, a, I was kind of disappointed with the effort or lack thereof, or maybe lack of time put into that game, and, uh, perhaps wanted to experience that game without giving, uh, Game Freak any additional money. Um, you know, uh, pre-owned is a great option out there. Now the used game smell, used secondhand smell like cigarettes or grandma perfume. A uh, grandma perfume. I remember. Um, okay, I have a, uh, a. I don't think it was perfume, but I do have a, a memory of bad perfume. There was a. I guess each year when we, my family, we get the uh, the Christmas ornaments out the garage or out the attic or whatever. And I'm the one the memory I have of uh, this is probably a, a discussion for a few streams ago when it was you know actually holiday time, but I remember uh, you know getting the family getting around and putting on a cheesy Christmas album, of uh, carols or whatever, and uh, decorating the tree right, and the Christmas ornaments were wrapped up in these newspapers, these old like funny comics from the '80s, from like the early to mid '80s. And being, like, a kid, even though it was, like, that was only, like, ten years ago, it was a bit before my time, and it was at an age when even, like, five or six years ago was still, like, really old to me. So it's, like, these old comics from, like, a, before my time, and they were from a newspaper that was out of state, there because they were wrapped in, like, there were Christmas ornaments that, I guess, my, from my, my, uh, my paternal uh, grandmother. And so just seeing these out-of-state newspapers and these old comics, I mean, they were, I think they were old enough that there were, like, some, there were some Garfield comics in there that had, like, the old, early old Garfield art style, where, like, Garfield was a bit more realistic. So it was crazy each year getting to see these same newspapers, because we'd, eat, we'd wrap them back up. Okay. I just lost control, I just lost my, I just tapped... Like, I just tapped my USB cable against the edge of... I don't know if there's something wrong with the cable. Now, am I going to have to... Am I going to have to uh, resort to... Okay, am I going to have to... Okay, I, know I unplugged the uh, the controller. I'm gonna, am I going to have to rely... I don't know if that's... This is never a problem I had before, where if I tap the end of the cable against the... You know what? I think this the edge on this US on this cable might be bad or something like that. Maybe that's what's going on. Hmm. Cause I'm gonna so I'm gonna once again I'm gonna lift the system from the dock. Now I'm gonna plug it back now hmm. I think I'm gonna have to restart the dock again. I think something's wrong with this USB cable. So what I'm going to do this time, it's just a shame because it's a nice long cable in which I should be able to, um, okay. What am I looking at? What is this? Is this someone's webcam? What is this image? You know what? This is something stored on the analog... Okay, I we just... Disc I don't know if this is an Easter egg. This is... Okay, but this freaked me out because I'm like, this is not my house. This is something... Uh, <laughs> this is something that is stored on the firmware of the analog dock. Um, because the reason I know this is from analog because I see the analog... I see several analog consoles in this photograph, 
So this is some kind of test pattern image that is just loaded into the analog dock to as a way to show that the dock is outputting to your monitor when a system is not in it. And this is like the equivalent of like once like if you ever once I was at my friend's house, he had a photo in a frame. We actually knocked into the photo and the photo fell out and behind it was a picture we had never seen before. And it was a picture he never saw. And we thought, like, is this the photo that it came with? Because normally when the, a photo comes with a frame, what it shows is, like, it'll show, like, the, the it'll have, like, the na brand name of the frame manufacturer. And it was a photograph of someone none of us had ever seen before. So we went to his mother and we were like, who is this? A, who is this? Like, is the picture of him fell out, and it was this picture of this person none of us had ever seen before, and the the mom kind of like was like, um, like, okay, this is someone who passed away before you were born, and we didn't think there were any photos left of them, and she was kind of like shaken because because she thought all the photos of them were lost, but so she was happy to find a photo of this person. Now let's drop this in the dock and see. If, okay, all right, so what, okay, it's showing, you can see on the screen, it's showing the display still, so what we're going to, I'm going to unplug this, I'm going to unplug the system again, I'm going to wait like 10 seconds, yeah, okay, that was an interesting moment, so we're going to plug that in, so I'm going to turn the dock on. Okay. No, it, my monitor went from saying no signal. Okay. Now it's not saying it. Okay, so if we drop this system in, is it going to? All right. I felt okay. Now we're now we're using the wireless connect. We're for the first time in a long time actually using the wireless connection on the the gamepad, the eight bit Doe controller. And so we're gonna resume with the game. That was very, that was interesting. <laughs> that was definitely not what I was expecting to happen. I don't know, I've never heard or, I never, well, I don't, I haven't watched a whole lot of footage of people using the dock, and I, I never got that to appear before or since, because normally, like, when, what happens is the system just shows a, oh, yeah, um, oh, Azure, okay, for, for transparent, well, transparency, ironically enough, okay, yeah, um, I'm just going to turn off this filter real quick, this makeshift filter I made. Because what I did, um, where's the green? Analog dock, frame green, icon still, okay. So this, what you see now, is what the game actually looks like. What this is, is going to pop back up, back up in a moment. I just took a green uh digital image file it's just solid green plain field like the you know the old flag of libya i just put that on my my light my layout in the broadcast software and turned down the opacity so it's transparent there's a way to simulate the uh the the screen of the original model game boy um so what i'm seeing is actually just the the plain black and white image so when that weird hat thing happened where it showed that I guess some kind of stop that some kind of test photograph that analog installed into the firmware of the system as like a test pattern type thing, which I never saw before. I was very for a second what I was like, what is happening? Like and Mario jumps out of Okay. Hold on, I have to look at 1974, okay. I had to look, fortunately my stream's on a little delay, so I could test, uh, 1974. So that's the third game of this session. 1,974 points, and we're just going to update that in the, uh, okay. 1,974. Most recent is 19, 1,974 points. And let's see, we have a pool. We have three scores so far. Wow, so we're only going into our fourth game of the session. Man, look at, I don't, 
I once I used I cheated once. Well, I che cheated. I wasn't genuinely passing off as an honest attempt, so it's not really cheating. But I used um, the restore points on the um, I used the restore points on the 3DS ver virtual console version of this game to uh, just basically play a perfect game through to the end. Who is the reflection of that person that was getting strangled? <laughs> yeah. I know you're kidding, Azurest, but crazier things like that have probably happened in something... No, for a second I thought, like... Like, it's, there's no way someone hacked my webcam and I'm... And, but they messed up and now I'm seeing into their house instead. If there's a picture of a guy at a computer that and it was moving, that's what I would have thought happened. But the, the monitor that I'm displaying this on has no has no connection whatsoever to my webcam. So I'd be very curious as to how that came about. Yeah, I know you're just kidding. I know you're just kidding. Uh, I've, I've, uh, I've uh, been around you long enough to know uh, when you're kidding and when you're not. <laughs> um, yeah. All right, okay, there we go. So 62. 65. You know, another thing I could add to this on-screen scoreboard is, like, how many games I've played this session. I think, uh, maybe four games, maybe, let's say five, let's say five games... I mean, it's not a big pool. I mean, that's not a big pool to draw from. But at, at five games, I think that's a point where I could uh, calculate an average to put up on the scoreboard. All right. And another, you know what I could do? Actually, no. Better than that, I once I have now that I have a high score, I guess I could calculate. I may, maybe I'll put these things into the ticker. I could calculate. Um, my improvement between the uh, nah nah. I'm making it too complicated. I guess it's more satisfying when I have a score that I'm trying to uh, beat in particular. Like when I was doing pinball, and I was going on. A, there was an online high score thing I'm trying to beat, and I can actually calculate. Okay, I need to get. Well, I need to improve my high score by like six percent to to climb up on the leaderboard or something like that. There's nothing quite like that here because I'm only going against my own. Um, best score. So it's not really as interesting of a stat. Because I had all those stats going on in my ticker of, you know, my improvement rate and how much I have to improve to beat the next uh, score up. Hey, 151, the number of Pokemon in the original uh, generation of, po uh, of, uh, of uh, Pokemon. The number of uh, creatures. Hey. 153. And by the way, uh, for those who are, not, uh, uh, if those who, who are, happen to see that big, like fistful of packs of booster cards I had accumulated over the course of uh, about a, two months, from getting you know a pack or two here, a pack or two there, but not being in a rush to open them, I do have. Um, I did open all of those, and uh, in particular, I'm. Focusing on filling out like the first like three generations, but uh, I have a, a system. I but basically my goal with Pokemon card collecting. Hot take: Mewtwo, Mewtwo should not be counted. It should not be counted because since he's a clone. Well, I mean, I don't. I wouldn't say that he shouldn't be counted, but what I would say is Mew should be before Mewtwo. Like like logically speaking, like. I guess the way they did it created a cool sense of mystery because there was a Mew too, but there was no Mew in the Pokedex. So there was a bit of a, a sense of mystery because I remember opening up Nintendo Power and those precious pre-internet days, opening up Nintendo Power because like Mew is mentioned in like the log books of one of the scientists in the, the burned out uh, laboratory in, on, in Cinnabar Island. And so it mentions like, oh, Mew, but then... Um, it doesn't say that, uh, you know, like, there's a Mew mentioned, but it's not in the Pokedex. It doesn't exist in the game. And actually opening up Nintendo Power 
and discover and the the issue they finally decided to do to pull the trigger on revealing that there's a secret 151st Pokemon. That was a big deal back then because there was so much marketing. And like they're like, oh, there's 150 Pokemon. They're like, oh, there's a secret 151st. That kind of opened the floodgates. Like, oh, like this the, that mystery Pokemon mentioned in the uh, the abandoned diaries and the burned out laboratory near the end of the the main story campaign of Pokemon uh, Red and Blue. It's actually in the game, and you can only get it if I didn't. I didn't really know about any of the in-person events at Toys R Us or whatever where you could receive Mew. The only way I knew of to receive a Mew was the Nintendo Power Giveaway. And I believe in the Nintendo Power Giveaway, there was very specifically uh, only, um, uh, only like, I think 151 winners in that give, uh, giveaway. And you actually had to mail your cartridge into Nintendo to receive the game, to receive Mew. And the crazy story, if you don't know about the, how Mew, I was actually added into the game like on the whim like it was i guess in terms of the lore always existed but it was actually programmed into the game by a single rogue programmer who like very close to like the dream had already been finalized it was uh, they it was gold as they say it was ready to be like the for the code to be mass to dumped on the cartridges and mass produced ready to ship to stores and one single developer decided on a whim to program Mew into the game, which is a very risky thing to do. And he did so without to consulting any of the other people involved with the development. And it was only after the game had already shipped that it was re that he re let everyone else know, hey, I actually programmed Mew into the game. And they were able to take advantage of that for promotional events and stuff like that. And it's really satisfying seeing my score uh, go up so rapidly. No, I was trying to be clever, trying to do that ricochet, ricochet shot and let it just slip right through into the, the uh, bottom of the court. All right, stage four. But still with, I mean, you should, any run, it's like you'd hope to like at least get to stage, stage four before losing a single life, right? Like honest, like a, a really serious high score run Probably I should get it to at least a thousand points. That's my standard for a really great run is I should have at least a thousand points To get that that one extra life and have a total of five lives before I lose even a single uh, ball Man that way that the way that ba -da -ba -da, it almost sounded like this the pause effect for Super Mario Brothers when you press pause it goes da -da -da -da. Okay, let me just Man, I cannot believe I'm actually retaining any kind of a, a, a viewership with this game. So thank you very much, uh, those watching. Um, yeah, this is probably the most... No, I, I thought doggone NES Pinball was basic, right? Or Versus Pinball. I thought those games were basic. Like this, like this makes versus pinball look like the most interesting thing ever with all the colors and uh, and sound effects and stuff going on, right? I um I think this game right here, uh, this um uh, alleyway. I think this is basically going to be for this. Like alleyway is going to be for any game that I play using the analog pocket. To, this will be for analog pocket games or any like analog pocket compatible games I own the physical cartridge for what versus pinball is for a lot of my Nintendo switch stuff because versus pinball is on the Nintendo switch on arcade archives so I often when I'm gonna do a dual game where I'll have a simple warm-up game oh yeah no no like any cool idea I have I encourage you if you think it's gonna work good for your stream go ahead and, and use it because, I don't know, I can't think of anything in particular, but I'm sure I've ripped off certain elements from other streams. Like, I think having the game box art appear on screen, along with the year of its release and the developer, I think I got that from Kyle's stream, even though he simplified it so he could get his, his layouts quicker. Because, especially now that he jumps 
at the time he was doing, you know, had the, the year of release and the system it was for and all that kind of stuff. The, at the time he was putting that in his layout, he wasn't jumping from, like, doing, like, seven to, a, like, have, doing a dozen games per stream sometimes with this uh, giant Wheel of Fate <laughs> gimmick. And so I could, I mean, honestly, uh, streaming would be so much labor intensive if I did not have these tickers for each stream with the customized stream number and the, uh, having each game. I want to, I like having the developer, the publisher, the system it was made for, the year of release, along with the custom stream number. It would be, I mean, uh, my streams are already, I, I took so much, I used to ha do custom uh, cards for social media for like Twitter and Tumblr. I used to have custom cards with the stream number and the time of broadcast for every single stream. The way I do my custom, like my social media cards for Twitter and Tumblr now are so much more less, so much less labor intensive where, okay. And now the way I do this, anytime I'm just playing alleyway, I could use the same card. Or anytime I'm just playing, so let's say Alleyway in Super Mario Land is a combo I go back to a few times. Anytime I'm doing that, I can use the same card. Uh, or anytime I'm just doing like, you know, Helios. Or anytime I'm going to Commander Keen, uh, the Earth Explodes. Anytime I'm doing a particular game or particular combo of games. I already have a lot of custom combos made for a lot of games, combos I know I might be going back to here and there. And I also have a lot of cards made. For games or combos of games I've never even played before, I have uh, cards made for like my social media posts announcing the streams for games that I might not play for months, if not more than a year from now. Like any game I know like that I already have or that I intend to play, like I already have cards, uh, spoiler for future games. I have not actually slated it on my, because I have games like ahead of what I have publicly announced on my uh, about page schedule but i do have games um uh like slated that i don't even have uh publicly a, a visible yet like i know i want to play musar Mus marsupalami within the next month or two uh, it'll really depend on how pokemon legends arceus goes if i stick with that as a streaming game I, that may be a game maybe i'll play it and i don't like it and i'd never go back to it again i'm gonna go at least Four hours across two streams with Pokemon Legends Arceus. But if it's a game I go back to and play regularly, I'm definitely going to, um, that's going to push back things like Marsupilami, for instance, or other more modern games. Or I, I've been sitting on Super Lucky Stealth for like a year. I update, uh, DM to an updated version of the Game Boy console thing we use. File. <laughs> he photoshopped the battery button to be on there. You know, I tried just putting in a little red circle, and it just was not very satisfying. And even as a kid, I remember in the 90s, when I first played, when I first was playing Game Boy, I found the battery indicator a little unsatisfying or not very useful, because with Game Gear, I remember, like, the light would actually grow dimmer the closer your batteries came to running out. Because with Game Gear, either you the system turned on or it didn't. And when it cut out of, of power at the end, it would just cut out. But as the system got closer to cutting out, the battery, the LED battery indicator on your Game Gear would actually grow dimmer. So you could actually tell to a certain extent how close, how much, how close your batteries were to dying. With the Game Boy, though... The battery, the, I feel like the light was either on or it wasn't. And that to me, I remember being a little kid, like within like the first hour or two of getting my Game Boy and thinking the battery light isn't is as useful as on the Game Gear because I could just tell if the system's on or off, but that's not too useful to me because I could just tell whether or not there's a game on the screen, whether or not the system is on or not. And uh, if you turn on the original Game Boy... Oh, how embarrassing. If you turn on the game, at least we made it to five lives. Because I think the only way you can even get to five lives realistically is if you get, if you have your full uh, set of lives that you start off with, and then uh, get the additional life for hitting one, 100, uh, for hitting 1,000 points. All right. 
So at least we made it to having five lives. So we know we're, we're this is gonna be a good earnest run at uh, getting a, a beating our old high score of uh, 27, 26. Now it's very nice in this particular case that uh, the full uh, like the full uh, the proper um res res uh, the real the restore point functionality. The full-fledged restore point functionality of the analog pocket is not in this current version of the operating system. That'll be included down the line, as well as the option to to uh, be able to play uh, game the Super Game Boy enhanced uh, Game Boy games. Because certain Super Game Boy games will have well, Super Game Boy certain Game Boy games will have enhanced audio functionality. And enhanced uh, graphics, like a certain frame that'll appear, like uh, Pokemon Red, Blue, and Yellow are examples of this. Where if you play it on a Super Game Boy, you'll have a cool uh, themed border. Uh, Donkey Kong for Game Boy is another game like that that'll have an arcade themed frame that'll make it look like you're playing it on an arcade cabinet, as well as additional voice samples that the original Game Boy was not capable of. Now I'm really fascinated. I doubt this will be the case. That you'll be able to play the fully enhanced uh, Space Invaders on Super Game Boy with the analog dock. Uh, if you're not aware, uh, Space Invaders on Game Boy, the U.S. release is a unique game because there's certain games that'll have you know, like the arcade frame on Donkey Kong when played on Super Game Boy, or the uh, the frame the for Pokemon Red and Blue when played on Game Boy. Uh, Space Invaders, you have the option to play with, like, I think an arcade uh, cabinet-type frame when played on television on Super Game Boy for Super Nintendo. Super Game Boy, if you don't know, is a cartridge that basically contained the guts of an entire Game Boy along with some special firmware that let you uh, custom-colorize games and other stuff like that. But with Space Invaders for Game Boy, well, two balls on one game, what a shame. Um... That will let you, um, yeah, super, like, the Space Invaders, the U.S. release of Space Invaders on Game Boy has, oh my goodness, I guess this is such a complicated thing to describe that it's distracting me from playing the game effectively, but what that game w includes is, um, basically a option that you can play like the 8-bit Game Boy Game Pack. Like the game, I have kicks right here. I just happen to have that on top of my computer just sitting here. So you you pop this, let's say this is, pretend this is Space Invaders. You pop this into your Super Game Boy and inside the cartridge is a 16-bit Super Nintendo ROM file for a Super Nintendo 16-bit version of Space Invaders. So you plug this in your Super Game Boy, and you have the option to download this Super Nintendo 16-bit version of Space Invaders into the the uh, RAM of the Super Game Boy and play a 16-bit version of Space Invaders on your television on the Super Nintendo. It is the only Game Boy game to use this function. And I find it odd that it would be a Taito game a third-party game to use such an interesting feature. I don't know if this is something Nintendo specifically deliberately engineered into the Super Game Boy to have this capability, or if it's something that Taito was just being creative and decided to throw in there. But it is the only Game Boy game to use that, that capability to have a 16-bit a version, a Super Nintendo game, a 16-bit Super Nintendo game hidden within an 8-bit Game Boy cartridge. Now you can look up on, uh... You can look up on uh, YouTube. If you type in Space Invaders uh, Super Game Boy Enhancement or something like that, there's a video file, a, well, a video someone made uh, explaining in, uh, in brilliant detail how this function worked and the history of it, and also the history of different... Because there's apparently a Game Boy release of Space Invaders in Japan that did not include that functionality. Alright. Alright, so we're... I mean, we're close to, for the second time today, getting to my favorite stage 
uh, of the game, at least as far as what I uh, usual, I'm likely to typically encounter in a game. I mean, just goes on the the game's attract mode alone. We see some stages that uh, I rarely, if ever, get far enough to play. Or, I mean, I've heard people just talk. I've heard in several. Oh, dog on. I've heard reviews of people just casually talking about, oh yeah, I casually just beat this game, which I guess is running through the full gambit of all the stages to the point where it loops back to the beginning. And just rolling the, you can roll up the score past 9,999 to the point where it starts using in-game graphics to represent the score. I Maybe it's because, I mean, I'm not like a hardcore gamer in terms of skill or talent. It's also true that I have a fine motor disability, so perhaps um, some games that might be really easy for some people, I find to be more of a reasonable challenge. Uh, but I've never uh, casually, like I've done it using a save state, so to speak, uh, run through the full array of stages and, oh, doggone. Okay, so we're on our last ball already. And we're in that fun range of uh, scores where the the years... Okay, we're already... We're almost past already. Uh, where the score reflects years that, um... You know, uh, you know. okay, 2018. That was only, a, you know, a few years ago now. Up, oh, 2020. Up, oh, that Up, oh, we're already we're already in the future. We're already in the future. Now. Oh, shucks. 2026. Oh, 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 excuse me. We have one ball left. Oh, yeah, I... Oh, that's right. I I rolled over every thousand points. You get an extra ball. So I was getting ready to, to record our score for him. Now this is exciting because um there uh in Discord later, Mecha Kong, I'm going to I'll send you a J, I'll uh, drop in Discord the JPEG that I or I think it's a PNG that I use to uh to uh to make this green screen filter for my uh, Game Boy layout. But we are in within uh, several hundred points striking distance, maybe literally so, of uh, beating today's uh, top score. Now that's the shame is that uh, next time, you know, if I am able to, I'll see if I can... There is a very rudimentary uh, temporary system for, um, for having a single save st state uh, type thing. And if I could do that, I could use that so that each time we play this, our actual top score will always be visible on the top score thing, which just makes it very easy to keep track of if we've beaten our old top score yet. I don't have to manually check against my other, um... Uh, well, it's the least I could do, given you're, uh, you're uh, enjoying, uh... I'm very glad to hear that you're enjoying Wind and Rain. Um, uh, so it's the least I could do for you. Now... Here we are, our favorite stage. I think this is the second time we've got here, second or third time we've got here. Come on, come on. Come on. No, 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 no. If that... No, we're, we're losing our opportunity to uh, get deep, get the score of the ball deep in there and score all those cool points we like to... Oh, get that! Oh, we're clearing out whole levels of the lower thing, and I don't want to. I want it to get that look, nice little nook, and get that good ricochet action going. That's so satisfying, and so musical. It's like na 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 na. It would be cool. One cool thing they could have done. If, I don't know if they could handle, like, just have the a music change like dynamically based on um if the ball is ricocheting against things, so that when you get that. Ricochet action, it's, you start hearing the, there we go, there we go. No, it didn't even last that long, shucks. I really gotta focus now, because uh, we got the small paddle at this point. Hey, hey, get the ricochet action going. And we beat our high score of the day. And that's the nice thing. We're still, like, early on in this. So we're in that nice 
early on sweet spot where the, the I guess the bar is set so low that you get the satisfaction of beating the high score fairly easily. And then as as I do better and the score high scores increase, it's gonna be less and less frequent and less and less likely that um now I because the the only remaining target is scrolling. Pretty much, my strategy at this point, I'm not focusing on hitting that. Okay, I coincidentally happened to hit it pretty quickly. But at that point, it's like if I keep it moving, I'm pretty much guaranteed to eventually, as long as I keep the ball in play, I'm eventually going to hit. See, look at that. The, 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 the bricks are already disappearing. And it's not like, like I'm not penalized points, but I'm losing the opportunity to score the points I would have got if I cleared those uh, bricks from the board using my ball. All right. Uh, one thing that confuses me, and a lot of the modern reviews of this game, like on, like when sites like Classified or Genre or whatever, I, I'm really annoyed that a lot of reviews review websites like ign and like nintendo life i think as well and i think even nintendo power which believe it or not like i think yeah i still had i was still subscribed to nintendo power at the time this game came out on the 3ds virtual console and i think nintendo power reviewed it this yeah they list one of the 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 primary or second they keep listing puzzle game as a genre for this and i'm like are so many people unaccustomed to like score attack arcade games that any game where you're clearing bricks they just automatically assume is a puzzle game because there's no puzzle element to this like yeah you're clearing bricks like tetris and i guess because of that alone they'll list this as a puzzle game and it's not it's clearly like an arc i would list the genre uh, as arcade uh, but then, um, another game I've seen this with is, uh, Mendel Palace, which is actually a game I've been meaning to feature on stream for, well, actually since before I started streaming, but then coincidentally it came out digitally as part of a Namco archive thing on the Switch, which I have part one of, but I never got part two, and part two is the, the, is the game that has, um, Hearing a weird noise uh, outside my window, something must be going d on downstairs out in the street. Um, yeah, Mendel Palace was actually it was a Famicom and uh, a game. It was released on NES in North America. No, excuse me, excuse me. The game is called Quinty, and the game uh, it was released for Famicom. Then for NES in North America, possibly Europe as well. It was released as Mendel Palace. And it was actually the first game by Game Freak. And even some of the sprite work and the artwork in the manual, if you look at it, is actually, you could very clearly see the artwork style and the sprite work style from uh, Quinty. Um, you can see the relationship between the sprite work for the character sprites and Quinty and comparing that to uh, Pokemon, uh, the original Pokemon games for Game Boy. And it was Game Freak's very first video game release. But game Freak before that was actually started as a magazine and decided to make a game of their own, which was uh, Quinty or Mendel Palace. And it was released in North America as... Well, or, yeah, it was Quinty and they released in North America as Mendel Palace. Now, we we're very... We're only a few dozen short, a couple of dozen uh, points shy of beating our record, which we are not going to do if I do not keep the ball in play long enough to get those last couple of bricks off the screen. But yeah, uh, like Mendel Palace, it's a it's a an arcade game with a begin with it's an arcade it's one of those score attack arcade games that also has a concrete beginning and end. But the cool thing is that you can play the the boards in any level, so you can practice on those harder boards you need more practice in, and then like when you're st first starting off, you can play them in order from easiest to hardest. But then once you're better at it, you can get those harder boards that you need more practice at out the way. And then play the easier boards and get those out the and those easier boards you know you can beat. This is the furthest we've gotten so far, but not the highest score we've gotten, which means in okay, we are now in high score territory. Which means in earlier attempts and, and that means in earlier attempts we must have Oh man. Okay, well fortunately that was just a bonus round. 
That means in earlier attempts, I did better at the... Okay, we still have this board on the attra attract mode. Which means in earlier boards, we must have I must have done a lot better on the uh, bonus stages to have a lot more points uh, on my board. Uh, because I definitely did not make it this far. But the fact that, like, Mega Man is kind of like, well, um... Well, like Super Mario Brothers. It's like those harder stages later in the game you need more practice in, but you have to play through the easier stages first. So that, that in that game, they balance it out by having the, um... Alright, I gotta, I gotta take a break real quick. I'll be right back. This is not our mainstream break, so I'll be back in eight minutes nonetheless. So I'll be back in a second. Okay, now that was interesting. Okay, so what happened there was, um, someone knocked on the door of the apartment, um, they were trying to deliver, uh, Postmates or Uber Eats or something to somebody, but they got the wrong number, or, like, couldn't, were in the wrong part of the building, so I had to, so, I had to, I tried to explain to them how to get to the actual place that they were supposed to deliver it at, and, uh, so that's what what's going on there. I really, I guess, I theoretically could have paused the uh, the timer for that, but excuse, yeah, yeah, it'll it'll be fine. Yeah, so now we're adding for the first time in stage ten. Oh man, I'm, we're gonna are we going to actually add nine thirty six? Are we going to add an extra? If we lose this ball before we get to three thousand points then that'll be the end of the game. But if we can keep the ball in play and get that that 3,000, then um, we have another ball, and each ball will be pretty much probably significantly extend the life, the duration of the gameplay. At this point, every single point is uh, increasing the high score, which on one hand is, yes, you want to get the highest score possible, of course. On the other hand, it's just making it, it's going to make it that much harder and less likely that... um. I'll be able to um, beat this score in the next run. Just set that bar higher and higher. No! Okay, I genuinely... That was 10 points. If I could have got... 1, 2, 3, 4... If I could have beat that... Okay. 2990. Okay, so... How about... Okay, so I gotta open up. Okay, so high score. Two, nine, nine, zero. Recent. Two, nine, nine, zero. Yeah, so how about we fill in, okay, we fill in that, um, two, nine, nine, zero. Alright, so we're going to... We have four scores to work with. Four score in seven years ago, aha. Uh -huh. Okay, so... So we're going to fill in that average. Alright. Calculator soup. Yeah, unfortunately I uh, didn't have this... Actually... 
I guess if I add a comma at the end of each one on the document, it'd be easier to copy and paste in. I'm going to round 22.93. All right, so we're going to just add that. Average. 22.93. Actually, nah, we don't need 22.93.5. Should I, it's, I mean, 0.5, uh, should I round up? Because you can't score a fraction of a point in this game anyway. So I'm just going to, my standard, I'm going to round up, because it's 5, we're going to round up to 22.90, hold on, what's, what was that number? 22.93.5, or going to, 94. We're going to up round that up to 94. Because it was 4 or less, we're going to round down. It's it's 5 or more, we round up, right? Because, I mean, we're finding averages. We are, um... Yeah, we're finding averages. We're using mean, median, mode stuff. We're doing rounding. So we're just using all our uh, elementary school and middle school uh, math skills here. Put them all, all to, uh, to good use. All right, so, you know what? Um, yeah, I'll. So we're gonna play. I'm gonna play a little exhibition game. I'm not going to count this. I'm not gonna count this. I'm gonna end the game when we run out of po points. Here. So we're gonna. We're not gonna play a full game here. But, but I can't. Uh, I wonder if the idea for me. To do the, to do the, actually what I can do. I'm gonna put. If you're interested in all this, hold on, games. Uh, I I also did something like that, kind of like this on my uh, for Mario Party Two, which I'm gonna dump into the uh, gonna dump in here right there. How about that? Yeah, if you want to see me do this kind of stuff for Mario Party Two, uh, on my own website, which deliberately resembles a website from nineteen that hasn't been updated since nineteen ninety nine. I promise. It's only, I haven't updated it since 19, no, since uh, 2014. Not, it hasn't been 19 since 99. It's been only since 2014, around the sign. I think the last thing I updated was when Pokemon Sun and Moon came out, and then I updated, like, the Thomas the Tank Engine page, where I have, like, a list of which episodes were adapted and not adapted, which book, stories from the original Railway Series books were adapted into a television series or not. But, um, yeah, there was a, I remember in, I guess it might have been sixth grade, there was a, we had a, one of our textbooks, they had a stock photo of a kid playing Super Mario Brothers. Uh, the cease and des um, okay, the cease and desist notice is oh you know what i did i did i take that down did i hold on i hold on i have to check i didn't think of this i am i okay um literature no creations it'll be under creations okay there is a story on my website in the creation section called the would-be revolution which is a very obsolete story in the in my fictional the set of my fictional universe, in which uh, doorworms and uh, lunarians exist. I'll explain this and then I'll go on my break. Okay. Yeah, it's a, okay. How do I explain this succinctly? A would be revolution is a very obsolete story set in my fictional universe in which doorworms which are the characters that you'll and lunarians which are these aliens from my fictional universe you'll see them in my break screen when i go to break right they actually i might as well just go to the break screen now and talk over the music so the little worm-like creature there and uh there's me as a lunarian at ihop with my pikachu uh new 3ds uh, eating some strawberry crepes there 
um, the story that these characters or creatures exist in, there's a story that this only doorworms are featured in this story. It's a story about the origin story of a villain from that universe of mine. And the it's a very obsolete story. The character is still canon. I just haven't worked with them in over a decade or written anything with them. That especially not that I've made public. And the punchline or the uh, it's about this character who he's a mad he becomes a mad scientist who's obsessed with trains, and he's a villain. But people think that because he's obsessed with trains, and I personally like trains that this character is supposed to be a sympathetic character, and he's not. He's a huge jerk. And the whole idea of this character was that he's an outrageous extremist who, like, takes everything to extreme degrees and thinks if anyone disagrees with him, he's their, like, their, they become his sworn enemy. And eventually, in his madness, he tries to burglarize a bakery to somehow advance his extremist belief, which he calls railwayism. And... He threatens to sue anyone who makes him look bad or disagrees with him. And a guy who has a doorworm, his door, uh, the doorworm attacks him and prevents him from burglarizing this bakery. And the idea was it was a fourth wall breaking thing where the character then issued me in real life a cease and desist notice demanding me to take down the story because it made him look bad. That's what the cease and desist notice thing is. So it's like a fourth wall breaking thing. It's like if on Sega's website, there was like, a they put a web page that was a cease and desist notice from Dr. Eggman threatening him to take down like all their stuff about Sonic because, you know, like he's like, it's making him as uh, the mad scientist look bad. Um... There's no, like, if I, I might have written that too convincingly. If you look at the, I tried to, I think if I remember correctly, the tone was so extreme that I thought there was no way anyone could take it seriously. Plus, in the order I listed them in, there should be no way, I thought there would be no way, if, if you read the story, The Would Be Revolution, which no longer reflects my best work, because this is a story I wrote in, like, 2006 or 7 or something like that. And, uh... Hold on. You know what I have? You know what happened? Okay. Oh, you know what? I think I did this deliberately because when I decided, when I realized, when I was having problems with people thinking the would be revolution was like actually something, like people were sit telling me that, like, oh, you know, I should take that story. People thought I was serious about the stuff that this fictional character was saying in the story. And he's not even the protagonist of the story. He's a jerk. He gets thrown in jail and it's like, like, I think he's the main character, but you're not supposed to empathize with him. It's supposed to be about what an outrageous jerk he is. But because people thought that he, because he, the character likes trains and I like trains, that I was, these reflected my actual personal beliefs that people were warning me, oh, you need to take the story down because, you know, you're going to get in trouble or you're going to get in trouble with the government in real life or something like that. Thinking I'm some kind of extremist. So I decided to take the story down. And I think what I did was I decided to make it double blind fourth wall breaking by just deleting the file from the server, but not taking down the link to the that used to lead to the story. So that way it made it look like the character himself, like someone actually sent me a cease and desist notice and I actually took down the story. All right, so that's what's, that's what's going on with the would-be revolution. I guess I might as well take them both down eventually. But what I'm gonna do is, um, so I'm going to, um, yeah, you're the first person to ever bring that to my attention. By the way, the, um, on supertrainstationh.com, the guest book on that website, if that guest book website even still exists, because I know there are not that many left. Guest books are a very, like, a remnant of 90s web design philosophy. So I'm going to set the timer for 10 minutes, and I will be back for another two hours, uh, I hope, of uh, Alleyway.
Hey everybody. I couldn't uh, interrupt that that uh, that hot track there. I had to let it loop at least once, so that's why there was a few seconds of delay before I got back properly. Now let's set the timer for. Oh no 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 no! Not 209 hours. Okay. One two zero. There we go. I'm good for two hours. And let's get back to the game. So, uh. So, our most recent run was our the highest score yet. Um. And this will be our. One, two, three, four. So, we're gonna start our fifth proper run. I messed around for like a couple of minutes just because I didn't really want to get into a game, like a proper, real run. And then, uh. Oh yeah, um, that was, um, that track there, that was, a uh, Noise Master's theme from, I believe, uh, the, a webcomic called Orange Adventure, which was, um, that, it was, that was created by, that track was made, um, for a, that, a character called Noise Master, I don't know anything about the, no, excuse me, the, the, the comic was called Cucumber Adventure, I think, is the name of the webcomic, and the, the track was made by Toby Fox. And actually, the, uh, the, the main motif from that track was later used as Metaton's theme in Undertale. And uh, it was the track in Undertale is called Metal Crusher. And I I liked the that motif from Metal Metal Crusher, which is used throughout all of the, the themes relating to uh, the Metaton character. So I thought that that motif was hot anyway. And then I found out that that tr the motif actually predated Undertale. And I think the uh, the Noise Master theme is actually I, my personal favorite version of that motif. And the two other main. Uh, tracks, if I remember correctly, that that track that motif appears in in Undertale, are called Metal Crusher, which is where the track is introduced. That motif is introduced in the game, along with the character themselves. And then, the probably the one that gets the most play in the remix scene is a battle theme with Metal Metaton, which is called uh, Death by Glamour. And Death by Glamour is cool because there's actually a lot of build-up before that motif kicks in there. Uh, you know, uh, what was it? It's funny because just uh, over the... You know what? Oh my gosh, I just... Hold on. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. I forgot to... Oh my goodness. Uh, I, I'm so sorry, chat. This whole time... The chat was supposed to... Oh, no, 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 no. That's not... That is the last... The very last thing I wanted to do. Please? Okay, okay. At least... We almost fixed that. We've got to get... Back down a little further. No, no, no. Actually, no. I have to get... I misplaced where the webcam is supposed to go. I have to... To figure out... I have to put it in the, back, the right spot where... No, okay. Okay. I have to put it... This should be the spot right here. Okay, there we go. No. Wait. Hold on. No. Okay, I for... No, it was... This was in front. And what was... Hold on, I gotta... Jump. Oh, no, no, I did not mean to make that... Okay. How far back can I look in this? I want to look back to how it looked like 10 minutes ago. Because I'm pretty sure... Okay, I was just trying to move chat up to the front so that chat is actually in the forefront because the chat was supposed to be appearing on screen this whole time and I not realize it was not. Chat box, there we go.
No, okay. This is being really silly because I'm dragging this very specifically. There we go. That's more like it. I'm going to put that there. And uh, please work with me. Please let me scroll. And again, I'm just scrolling it down there. I'm just going to drag it down. This is, only the, this is the first time I've used this version of the layout because I had a generic, I have like a Game Boy variety layout, right? Where it'll, no, I can't scroll down any further. Oh, I can only, I can't scroll down. I can scroll up only and chat can go above me because I think that my chat is more important than I think I like chat to have a place of honor. So when people are actually talking to me, that could jump in front of me. Okay. All right. So we're good. We're good. All right. That was scary. They're saying uh, most of the Studio Ghib Ghibli library oh, shucks, is on uh, HBO Max. Um, I don't know. It's like, uh, I don't know. I just, even if I only watch a movie once every year, or once every two years, I just like having, just knowing, okay, the movie is in, on my drawer in that location and when I want to watch it, I just take it from the shelf and put it in the machine. Not like, oh, like, is did the am I is my subscription to whatever service paid up? Is some movies I like on one service not another? And oh, did the contract between uh, Netflix and whoever run out and they took it down? Or oh, they are they're, they're, the such and such is going away at the end of the month. They only have a few days to enjoy the. I just like having it there. It's physically concrete there. I have to worry about it going away. But, um, no, if I did, if I, I don't, I don't casually watch Ghibli films that much. Like, like, uh, over winter break, uh, when I was, uh, well, I mean, winter break is though I'm in school or I like, get a job and I was like a winter vacation or something like that. Or like, um, like over the holidays, I was, uh, I was visiting my mom. who uh, lives quite a, a, a drive away from me. It's like a more than 10 hour drive away. So I, um. We were, I brought some of my DVDs, we watched, what did I watch? What did we watch? We watched, oh, we watched uh, Castle in the Sky. And actually, I think me and uh, Mecha Kong were talking about Castle in the Sky not too long ago on another stream. And he was saying that he doesn't like the Disney dubs of the Ghibli films because basically... A lot of them are, you know, just, like, uh, celebrity voice actors. Like, um, Mark Hamill. Like, Mark Hamill is not, like, he's an actual, he actually has, like, an extensive, he has, like, more than, like, closing in on 30 years of voice acting history. Mark Hamill's not just some ra random flavor of the week, like, A or B list celebrity that it's like, oh, we're doing a mainstream animated film. Let's get a random A-list or B-list actor, that Flavor of the Week actor, to play that role so we could, you know, hype it up in the commercials and get people to watch the movie. He's, like, actually, like, uh, he has, like, like 30 years, pretty much, of history with, with voice acting and animation. He's done all kinds of acting work, from, like, Hollywood films to weird, like, to, like, the live-action cutscenes in freaking Wing Commander, right? He has all kinds of different stuff he's been in. But I know, like, I forgot which movie, but, like, one of the more recent, I mean, recent as in with, like, the last 15 years, one of those more recent Ghibli films, I think they got Daisy Ridley uh, to play a major voice. And, uh, what, in The Cat Returns, I think they got Anne Hathaway to voice... Uh, the main, uh, the voice Haru, the main character in The Cat Returns. And I'm not big into ho mainstream Hollywood films, frankly. And I don't follow personalities in the acting world that much. So, for some people, just hearing those voices coming out of a, a particular character, like, really takes them out of it, out of the movie. And that's not, hey, hey, Mechacom, were you... Uh, I speak of the of the the Kong, and he shall appear. Um, I was um 
Yeah, if you, I guess if you really know a certain actor or actress and their, their voice really sticks out coming out of an unfamiliar character, or they basically they're not really much of a voice actor, so every character they voice just sounds like them, how they act in every movie or role they're in. For me, I don't follow personalities and celebrity. I don't watch a lot of Hollywood films or uh, mainstream television. So I don't really suffer that so much from the use of Disney voice actors in all the celebrity, um, when they use those celebrity voice actors to dub the uh, Ghibli films. Now, speaking of uh, questionable uh, Studio Ghibli dubs, I mean, technically, it's not a studio. I mean, retroactively, it is considered part of this Ghibli filmography due to its unique history. But for Nausicaa, I actually, um, I actually, we were talking about this on stream. I think it was a MechaKong stream. I ended up, uh, finding a VHS copy of The Wind Warriors, which is an infamous 1980s, um, English language dub of Nausicaa. And I haven't watched it, but I just know this, this dub, this English language dub of Nausicaa, it was a, not just a dub, it was like a localization, arguably a bastardization, of um, Nausicaa that was so bad that it personally offended um, Hayao Miyazaki so much that he refused to let his movies be dubbed into English until I think, um, I believe John Lasseter, who was friends with Hayao Miyazaki, Somehow, like, through Lasseter's connections with Disney, I think, I'm, I might be telling the story, like, uh, with some details scrambled, but the general effect is somehow Lasseter and, a connect and his connections with Disney and his friendship with Miyazaki was able to convince um, Miyazaki to allow Disney to handle the English language localization and release, a theatrical release of... Um, Princess Mononoke. And, uh, that started a relationship between uh, Studio Ghibli and, uh, between Ghibli and, um, but yeah, between Ghibli and Disney, that's, I think, continued on to this day. Um, or until at least until very recently. Now, uh, Michael Keaton is Porco Rosso. No, I've never actually seen Porco Rosso, and I have never seen Michael Keaton. The only things, movies, I have not seen Michael Keaton outside of a superhero film, frankly. So I probably wouldn't have that bad of a time, like, hearing the voice. And with, like, the Disney, like, not, I don't have the celebrity, like, sort of whiplash or experience, like, problem to deal with, as I explained. So, frankly, I find the Disney Studio Ghibli dubs to be very acceptable. Like, the kid in, um, like, the main male character in, in Lapita Castle in the Sky. I think they should have dubbed uh, his voice. He sounds a little too old. He sounds more like a young teenager instead of a little kid. And they could have got the performance that sounded a bit younger for that role. And then uh, there's a character in, um, in The Cat Returns. And I saw the dub of The Cat Returns originally. I saw the, the dub. And they cast the dub. They did a masculine voice. But it was a very particular sort of masculine voice. And I think it suited the character fine. Then when I listened to the ori the subtitle version with the original Japanese voice performance, I came to find out that the char the the character was very explicitly cast as a female role, and the way the 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 original performance made me think of sort of a performance as a, a character akin to Isabel in Animal Crossing, whereas the ma the more masculine performance in the English dub gave me a very different sort of character 
a very sort of different feel or texture for the character that I feel suited the role very fine, but gave a very different impression of the character. And I actually like them equally well, though. I I mean, Isabel, that type of, like, like secretarial sort of character is so endearing that I do prefer the Japanese performance for that particular character. Whereas, like, the... The, I feel like the, when you see the appearance of the character and don't have the dub to go off of, the performance that they chose, the uh, the talent and the performance that they went with for the English dub, I think actually suited very well. Those are the only two times I really had that I felt like the maybe the dub was a bit better. I mean, the subtitle, the original Japanese performance, might have been a bit better than the, than the dubs. Now... Um, for Castle in the Sky, Mark Hamill was Muska, who was the main antagonist of, um, the main antagonist of Castle in the Sky, or Laputa. Um, there are a couple of moments when he's screaming and really angry, where Mark Hamill's performance as Muska really flat out does sound like his performance as the Joker, and you could really tell it's him, but I, you can't tell... Like, that it's Mark Hamill, but if you listen to his performance as the Joker and then listen to his performance as Moose, you can tell it's the same performance a little bit. Then, there's a very, um, portly general character in, um, a very portly general character in Castle in the Sky. And when you listen, there are a couple of moments when that character where you could tell, like, okay, this just sounds like Dr. Robotnik from Sonic Set AM. And then you look into it and it's like, yeah, okay, I figured it was the same, like, like voice actor. But the thing is, that doesn't, that doesn't bother me really for voice actors that are professional voice actors and do a lot of specific voice acting work. Just because voice actors tend to, like, like Chris Summer, like, gets around so much and has done so many very different roles. Such as almost every black girl, little black girl ever in a lot of animated stuff as a joke that she herself has made so i don't feel bad making it <laughs> myself um but uh yeah but uh, oh, oh doggone that was just clumsy that was just clumsy you just watched porco rosso on hbo max okay that's what i have to catch up on i have to catch up no i have to watch on my own time which is, this is something I, isn't something i do often I want to, I need to sit down, and I usually don't watch movies unless I'm watching movies with my friends using, like, uh, you know, a remote viewing uh, function on the computer, but I need to sit down and watch, no, I only saw Nausicaa once, really, on DVD, and it's the same copy I have. I only watched Nausicaa once. I need to sit down and watch that movie again before, and actually I'll watch the, the I watched the, the Disney dub. I need to sit down and watch the subtitled version of, of Nausicaa with the original Japanese uh, voice performances and then watch The Wind Warriors which I have which I managed to source a VHS copy of and just see how absurd the uh, The Wind Warriors is to the point where it actually offended Hayao Miyazaki so much that he would not allow his works to be uh, localized into uh, into English again until he had his personal friend John Lasseter give him the assurances and backing of, of Disney Corporation that they would not literally bastardize his works when they made the English releases. You know, and Princess Mononoke, that's another movie I need to see now that I'm... I have not seen that movie since, um, not, since I was, um, like a kid, frankly. And I don't... I remember seeing Princess Mononoke on VHS. Like, I got it from the library. I had a cool library that actually had, you know, somewhat obscure, especially back then, releases like the VHS of Princess Mononoke. When it came out on DVD, and I just remember being fascinated by it. I mean, I was... I, mean, I wasn't like a, a little child. I wasn't like a toddler or anything. And I was like in... I was like in eighth or ninth grade or something, I think, when that movie came out, and the English dub came out, and I remember being fascinated by it and being blown away because it was my first Studio Ghibli film, and 
it was the first time I had seen animation. Like, I'd been so used to... Like, my main frame of reference for animation at that point was probably, like, Pokemon, Gundam Wing... Yeah, it was Pokemon, Gundam Wing, and Dragon Ball Z. And actually, Dragon Ball. I don't even think... Yeah, Pokemon, Dragon... Like, I, I was one of the only kids... The only kid I knew who was actually exposed to the Eng an English... I don't know if it was a different English dub than the one that, that circulated now. It was an English dub of Dragon Ball that I had on VHS. It was like... It was a, mo it was a movie compilation of the whole, like, Curse of the Blood Rubies arc, or the... That I think comprised the first season of the animated series of the of the television anime of Dragon Ball, and I encountered that movie before Dragon Ball Z started airing on Toonami. So I remember watching Dragon Ball on VHS and being like, "Oh, there's this cool anime. You've got to see this it's called Dragon Ball." No one heard of it. Then my friends started talking about like Dragon Ball Z, and I hadn't heard of that. I'm like. I was like, oh yeah, Dragon Ball, uh, Dragon Ball. I have like, no, the, my friends would actually say like, no, it's not Dragon Ball. It's called Dragon Ball Z. And they didn't realize that Dragon Ball Z was a sequel series to another anime, which was a, a Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z themselves being uh, an, an adaptations of the uh, the mangas by the same, those same respective names. So we've got, uh, we're not doing great in terms of, uh, having a lot of extra balls remaining. But, uh, we have, uh, we have gotten pretty far. We've gotten all the way to stage six. The, uh, bonus stages, uh, do count, uh, towards, uh, they, uh, are included in the stage count, even though it's a, a low, r there's no, there's no penalty or anything. We're here, we're just scoring all the points we can, and if we do manage to clear the, uh, the, the, the entire court, we are rewarded with a, a big cache of bonus points. I think a 500 or even a thousand points. And a long, and, ex and an extended jingle. No, we're not gonna get it this time. Unless we get, like, no, not happening. No, but yeah, so... I was I wasn't a little kid. I was like a, a preteen or early teen. Oh my goodness! How embarrassing! That's a shame. When uh, Princess Mononoke came out, the English dub came. Out. I remember on EAGB, which was really the first web forum. I've been in AOL chat rooms going back to like AOL 3.0, but the EAGB Euro Asia Game Boy. Even though I'm a North American gamer, uh, Euro Asia Game Boy EAGB. Was one of the was a, one of the sites that had a lot of great uh, pre-release uh, earlier co early coverage of Pokemon Gold and Silver before like the and I remember uh, finding the site through that and man I am really bombing the stage right here okay non a Greek non-fat coconut yogurt with crunchy honey granola oh yummy um what is it I I had a what a Greek uh, for, uh, uh, I, oh my goodness, that was, that was, what a, what a shame to bomb this far into, uh, this well into the, the session, but, uh, yeah, EAGB, you, oh goodness, 2055, 2055, so we're gonna add that, and we're gonna pull up a uh, GIMP, and we're gonna... And we're gonna add th that newest score. Uh, and we'll calculate. 2445.8, so 2... Two two four six. We're gonna have it. Two two. Two two. Four six. Went from ninety four to forty six for our average. So uh, that game was so bad it dragged down our average a bit. How embarrassing! We've got to uh, redeem ourselves with this next run here. Man, that was almost a half. I can't believe that was almost a half hour of gameplay. Gee whiz. All right, let's uh, let's uh, shake it off.
And it was a bad run. It, it dra dragged down our average a bit. We'll just jump right back into it. So EAGB, Euro Asia Game Boy, was a, 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 a site that had a lot of great coverage of import uh, Game Boy and Game Boy Color games. Because remember, this is well before Game Boy. This was at a point where Game Boy Advance wasn't formally announced yet. And it was so recent that there were rumors of Project Atlantis still. And what we thought was that when they announced Game Boy Advance, we thought that was Project Atlantis. But Project Atlantis turned out to be a completely different uh, project for a 64-bit Game Boy that never went forward. I mean, imagine, I mean, Game Boy Advance was a 32-bit unit. Imagine a 64-bit a Game Boy releasing in the late 90s. When a, a handheld of similar caliber from Nintendo wouldn't come out into, like of, of that scale of, of, uh, of performance till the doggone DS. But anyway, because we're games, and so we, that was my first exposure to like a lot of anime discussion on the old uh, EAGB forums. And what was it? Uh, the I have to I, that's a tick I have to get rid of that. What was it? And right, I have to I hate those two ticks. I need to, to watch that and improve my uh. My vocabulary. So, uh, those are just parts of normal human speech patterns, just developing weird little t ticks and habits of that sort. However, um, I remember uh, Princess Mononoke having limited runs in uh, theaters, and it just being a big deal. Oh my gosh, they're actually going to show an anime in theaters. You know, it, it limited, limited engagement, you know, screenings. And I remember when I saw it on videotape, just being blown away. Um, I didn't. I mean, I understood the sort of the sort of the themes of uh, industrialism and technology versus uh, nature and tradition and stuff like that, and nature being disrespected and you know and, and the rise of industry uh, harming nature. I understood those basic themes simple enough that I could remember them more than 20 years later because I it's it's been like close to closing in on 25 years since I've seen Princess Mononoke right and well there we go with that right nonsense again more than 20 years since I've seen Princess Mononoke more than 20 nearly 25 years but anyway I uh, so I remember the the general themes enough that I got that sense of it but I um I could probably. It's one of those movies that if I watched it now as an adult, it would probably blow me away. At the time, I was just blown away by the quality of the animation. Because like I said, my frame of reference for animation at the time, especially and for anime in particular, was American Saturday morning cartoons, and then stuff like Gundam Wing, Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z, and Pokemon. And I remember watching, just the, I remember the one thing I remember the most is the way the grass the tall grass billowed in the wind in Princess Mononoke and thinking like wow like Pokemon's animation looks like crap like this is like blows Pokemon out the water you couldn't pr get into Princess Mononoke it was slow and boring to you I can I can see I can I mean I like I said uh, there might be movies maybe from around I under I was blown away by the animation. I can't even say, and the, the ideas and the characters were interesting, you know. Uh, but you loved Spirited Away. Uh, okay, how about this? How about this? Here's an interesting question. It's one thing to ask what your favorite Ghibli movie would be, right? But if you could live in the world of any Ghibli film, or if it takes place in our own world. Or if 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 you could live in the story or setting or experience the story of any particular Ghibli film, what one which one do you would you think you'd want to go for? Um, I'd probably the one I would probably choose is might be cheating. I would probably want to. It would be fun to live through the story within a story from Whisper of the Heart. Not the actual story of Whisper of the Heart, which takes place in our own real world with no magical elements, but the story uh, that the main character of Whisper of the Heart is writing, because she's writing a fantasy novel throughout the throughout Whisper of the Heart, and there's like different scenes. It plays through several short scenes which they do animate. The story she's telling in there sounds fascinating, 
And theoretically, I guess that means technically I'd want to live in the world of the Cat Returns. But the Cat Returns is like a meta story. Like, the Cat Returns is like a prequel to the story within a story. It's a, like the Cat Returns, that the Ghibli film from like 2004, is a prequel to the story within a story from Whisper of the Heart. And and that story within us and, and it, within both of those stories within a story, it's about a girl from our own world who goes to a magical other world where the Baron lives. And the Baron seems like a character, a kind of Doctor Who type character who bounces between worlds. Your favorite part. Oh, Whisper of the Hat is at the end where the Dapper Cat is shown. <laughs> uh, yeah, Whisper of the Heart is, um... Yeah, she's such a... Yeah, like, because you don't know much. And, like, the story within a story from Whisper of the Heart, which I believe is actually called Whisper of the Heart, to make this even... Add more la layers of complexity to this. Um... I don't think you learn that much about the character of the Baron or what happens. Other than that, within that story, I think he actually is a cat figurine. Which... Yeah, uh, The Cat Returns, I believe, was 2003 or 4, and Whisper of the Heart was from the mid to late 1990s. And in that time, the animation, like the technology, the way they colored it, like I guess it got updated. And they're using different techniques, so it looks a lot more, um, shiny, I guess. Whereas, Whisper of the Heart maybe looks a bit, has a bit more of a grit to it, I guess you could say. And then, in the story within a story, like the story, like the fantasy story scenes within Whisper of the Heart, where it shows inside her imagination of the story she's writing, has a, a distinct difference in the art style, where it's a bit more like a, a painting. And those uh, scenes are actually, a lot of those scenes were actually based on a, I'm going to, okay. Are based on the works of a certain, uh, Jap a certain Japanese um, surrealist artist called, um, called Naoisha Inu. Or in no way, I'm not sure how if I'm saying that right. I'm sure I'm butchering it. Butchering it. Whisper is Miyazaki style cat returns with somebody else. Yeah, I think the backstory, and that's that artist's website, and that artist is I think kind of in, uh, takes is a, a slight, somewhat inspired by um, the Little Prince, um, in the sense that like there are these little tiny planetoids. These worlds made of little planetoids that are kind of similar to the worlds of Mario Galaxy 1 and 2. Where they're little planetoids with, with like, altered gravity that the characters are jumping back, back and forth between. And sort of flying in between. And, um... Yeah, and I believe, like, production-wise, I think the... Like, the project that became, um, The Cat Returns was initiated because Heo Miyazaki was planning to retire soon. So they wanted to bring up some of the, uh, more junior animators to sort of lead their own projects to take up the slack once, uh, Miyazaki retired. And he did retire, uh, later that uh, later soon after the cat returns and then he proceeded to retire annually uh, basically every year since i mean we're almost halfway through january and my joke is like how many times is Hayao miyazaki retired this year because it feels like every other year or so you're hearing about Hayao miyazaki retiring and, and working on his last movie ever and then like a couple years later he works on something else i think the last major project he worked on was i think at some point there was a particular project. There was a crossroads where he was either going to make... I forgot whether it was Spirited Away or... I forgot if Spirited Away was Miyazaki personally, but he was either going to make Spirited Away or Princess Mononoke. And I think what he decided... And he had a cross... He had to choose between either... I forgot whether it was Spirited Away or Mononoke. It was one of those two and another project. And he decided to go with that other movie. And then... 
I think his most recent movie was him finally returning to that other concept he had for a film that he decided to put a, to set aside. Or maybe it was even Ponyo. I forgot if Ponyo was even Miyazaki personally or not. But it was there was some point where Miyazaki had to choose like between these two projects, and he decided that the other project was more important to him personally, so he shelved the other project, possibly never to make it. And I think the most recent one was him going back and finally doing that other one. I think some of them. I remember reading of several different pieces of interviews with uh, Hayao Miyazaki. Basically about, like, him being sort of fascinated in a really weirdly detached kind of way with the idea of, of Armageddon and the, the apocalypse. And I think there's some quote, and I know, like, he, he, Miyazaki has some colorful quotes that have led to the point where um, a lot of, there are a lot of fake meme quotes or quotes made slightly out of context that have sort of circulated in meme form on the internet. But there's some quote that I'm surprised hasn't, I haven't been, cir been circulated in meme form where he's like, oh, like something to the effect of like, oh, I hope I live to get to see the end of the world because it'll be incredible and there's going to be earthquakes and tornadoes and massive like like thousand foot tidal waves crashing into cities or something crazy like that where he made it sound like he wanted to go see like a, like a football game or a destruction derby or something. But he's talking about the end of industrialized civilization. Which is a theme that several of his film of uh, either Miyazaki or just Ghibli in general films have um, played into. Now I was talking a bit earlier. If you're unfamiliar with the uh, Studio Ghibli filmography, I was talking about the Wind Warriors and Nausicaa. How it was not technically a Studio Ghibli release, but due to its history, is sort of retroactively, I think officially speaking, like even by studio uh ghibli's own historian official historians considered part of the ghibli filmography basically studio ghibli like nausicaa was basically like i think there was a loop in the third movie that i for never actually got to see i actually might have saw it on vhs like a, a bootleg vhs copy in like the early to mid 90s that my brother borrowed from a friend. I remember it was like a hand copy tape that had like, it was someone hand drawn, like a picture of like the Lupin, I guess his name is Lupin the third. And it just says Lupin, like handwritten on it. And I think it was back when like anime was still super obscure. They were like, you know, it's all about like bootleg, like fan subtitled copies back when these like anime was like a really sort of niche thing. I'm really kind of obscure, but I don't even think it, I remember my brother talking about it, and they, we didn't even, he didn't even use the term anime. What do you, him and his friends, they call it Japanimation. It was, it wasn't until the late, later 90s, around 98 or 99, that I first heard the term anime. They were calling it Japanimation. And the, the days of like, like bootleg, copied, fan subbed VHS tapes. Uh, and that you, and, it was a copy of Lupin the Third. I think it was that same movie that I think Miyazaki and a few of his friends or a team he would work with occasionally on stuff. They made this Lupin the Third, uh, which is a long-running, I think, manga franchise in Japan. Um, that they made that movie together, and as I understand it, they decided they wanted to make a get together and make a like a major like original anime film together. So they basically got, like, some investors together or something to, like, agree to put forward money to make the film. But basically they were like, listen, we want to, we want to do a project with you, but we, it's, it's, we'd feel more comfortable if you did something based on an existing IP, like that was based on a manga or something that already had a following, so that when we go to do the movie, we know there's a built-in audience of fans that are going to go and and see the movie to help like kickstart its uh you know its uh success in the theaters during its theatrical run so basically i think me i think the story is miyazaki basically created the world of nausicaa and started doing the manga series and basically specifically to build a fan base that they could get a good readership for to show, I guess, the uh, investors or the pro or the production committee or whatever that listen, we do uh, uh, we have this uh, Nausicaa comic, 
and we we know that uh, there's a built-in uh, readership for it, so they felt more like confident enough to greenlight the funding to do the the animated film adaptation. So it was like an adaptation. So Nasco is basically an adaptation of a manga, but it was a manga that uh, was made specifically to be adapted into a film. And basically, that became a success. And after that, the I guess the team that did Nausicaa got together and like, hey, let's like actually formally build a studio specifically so we could do films together. And that was what became Studio Ghibli. So I think the f first film actually released under the Studio Ghibli name was, and like with the Studio Ghibli logo at the beginning, was, was Laputa, which was... Uh, trans translated or was local and in its international release it was called Castle in the Sky sometimes I also see it called Laputa Castle in the Sky because well Laputa is well basically the interesting thing about Laputa to me is that it's basically a fan fic of Gulliver's Travels based on the idea of Laputa the flying city that because when you think of Gulliver's Travels you think of the, uh, the Max Fleischer Gulliver's Travels adaptation from, I think, the 30s or 40s, and the Jack Black movie from, like, 15 or so years ago. You think of the most famous scenes from Gulliver's Travels, I guess, the, the thing that gets ad adapted all the time are the first kingdom that Gulliver goes to, which is Lilliput, which is the city of, well, the island of, of tiny people that are, like, the size of ants or something. And so he's like a giant in this on this island. And I guess the idea of that in particular, especially since it's the first kingdom he visits, is so fascinating that that's been the subject of almost all the adaptations I've seen or heard of in terms of like like motion pictures and animated versions and cartoons. Meanwhile, uh, in the book, he actually... Uh, well, it's called Gulliver's Travels. He travels to many kingdoms. I think first he goes to... First, he goes to a Lilliput, Lilliput, excuse me, which is the island of tiny people. Then he goes to, I forgot the name of the place. I think it's something with a G. And, which is an island in which now he is like the size of an ant, and he's amongst an island of giant people. Where he's the tiny thing that they're treating as a pet now. And then... He goes to, I believe, next he goes to Laputa, which is the city in the sky, a flying island of high technology, which is created by sort of a bunch of uh, scholars and scientists uh, who are basically uh, ruling, dominating other city-states that are still living on the ground with their high technology. And you could be. This could be seen almost even as a uh, sort of a prelude to uh, the idea of uh, Midgar in Final Fantasy VII, where there's a city in the sky of high technology, and then the lower class, weaker people that are forced to live, uh, you know, are subjugated by them and live it literally in their shadow. And the Laputa was had all kinds of high technology, but it's high technology from like a Victorian standpoint. So they come up with ideas like. There was a scientist who's trying to squeeze the sunlight out of cucumbers to make liquid sunlight. And I've seen skeptics of, um, you know, alternative energy and future energy development sort of liken, you know, the, the movement to uh, try to develop solar energy and alternative uh, renewable energy towards the scientists in Latvia to try to squeeze the sunlight back out of cucumbers. Um uh, other l weird little projects like that. There's one project of some of uh, where they're trying to turn uh, waste back into uh, food. I'll just leave it at that. Which is actually technology that's actually used, I think, in stuff like developed for stuff like uh, stuff like space stations and spaceships where there's limited food supply. There's like composting toilets where the uh, the waste is then can be processed into a uh, to uh, fertilizer that, that can be then be used to gar as a to have a, a vegetable garden and grow more food but uh but one thing that Laputa did was they would drop giant rocks giant boulders on to other cities that they were at war with and it was kind of a a, uh, a criticism of imperialism and possibly of maybe even the British Empire itself 
And the uh, the name Laputa, if you're a uh, bilingual in uh, both English and Spanish, uh, uh, L A P U T A is two words in Spanish. Uh, it has an alternative meaning, which I uh, won't speak out loud. That uh, if you were bilingual in Spanish and read Gulliver's Travels, kind of has an alternative um, translation. That uh, I think readers of the day might have gotten a little additional insight as to maybe Jonathan Swift's um, personal feelings of uh, what these this high tech city dominating other cultures with their technology. Uh, he doesn't really maybe think highly of them. And it's funny thing, the scholars in Laputa talk about that the um, Laputa means something in an ancient language that they don't know the meaning of, but they're sure it means something auspicious and noble, and it actually uh, doesn't. He's a very, uh, uh, Jonathan Swift, he's a very uh, outspoken critic, uh, critic of uh, maybe exploitative, exploitative uh, societal and economic systems, uh, which he also... Um, now, what is the next, uh... So, when they... Studio Ghibli took the idea of Lap, you know, the Flying City, and wanted to make a film based on it, they, um, did not realize that Laputa had an alternative, uh, translation uh, in certain languages that could be perceived as, uh, vulgar or, uh, offensive. So, when, uh, Disney was, uh, charged with, uh, developing this for, uh, audiences outside of Japan, they uh, changed the name from Laputa to Castle in the Sky. Now, the actual uh, ca castle in the sky of the city in the sky, Laputa, is actually called Laputa in the anime, but the title, so they don't have to put the word Laputa on giant posters and on the cover of the film, is not used in the title of the film. Now, um, now so they, he visits the island of giant people, no, the island of tiny people, the island of giant people in Gulliver's Travels. Then he visits the island, the flying island in the sky of high technology. And I forgot if there are any other lands he visits, but what I do remember in particular is that the most fascinating, everyone, all the adaptations of Gulliver's Travels over the decades, and Gulliver's Travels is public domain, so anyone can go ahead and make an uh, adaptation of it if they want. All those different adaptations um, seem to be fixated on the island of uh, tiny people in which uh, Gulliver is now a giant, even though he's just a normal-sized human to uh, you and me. Um, they decided to focus on that. Now, I believe the final island that Gulliver goes to on his travels is an island of man-eating anthropomorphic horses. And for some reason, they decided that this was not an interesting enough idea to explore in the form of, especially now that we have, like, CG and stuff like that. We could easily animate this with CG, as long as they don't, like, get, honestly, get some, get any, get any artists from, like, Furfinity or DeviantArt or someone to animate this. Do not go to, do not get the people who did the Cats uh, anim, uh, live action uh, abomination to do this. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, go, uh, yeah, Gulliver goes to an island of anthropomorphic man-eating horses and begins to kind of lose his sense of self and for some reason, and like they're like the, the local humans on this island um, are the like, I guess they're kind of like cavemen or something like that. And the the horses, like the carnivorous horses, eat those and cook. They kill, cook, and eat this, these people who are they call yahoos. And the man-eating horses are called the winnums. And I guess Gulliver decides. I think the horses, I guess, decide to draw a distinction that, like, oh, like the yahoos are like these sort of beasts you know they're animals that are made to be like you know, hunted and cooked and, and raised for food but this this uh this gulliver creature that's come to us he's clearly a, a sapient intelligent being and a person and not an animal so he they accept gulliver into their society and he actually joins them in hunting and eating the the uh the yahoos the native humans of this island and he begins to like he be becomes he be he basically starts to believe himself to be a, a a horse and not a person, and starts to go nuts. And he goes back to 
either goes back to England or writes a letter for, back to England and when he, he describes all these things and he specifically says that he refuses to de I believe I have not read this since like college so this is many years back but I believe he specifically says that he refuses to divulge the the coordinates of the location of the island of the uh, the Winhams because the Winhams are such like noble and fine people that like regular humanity like homo sapiens like uh you and uh, at least several of the uh, the people watching are like just so like beneath them that we do not even deserve to be in their presence, and that he's basically going to go to the island of man-eating horses and live among them for the rest of his life. I believe is how that story kind of ends. Um. Oh, doggone. Yeah, I need to go. I haven't done this. I need to go on like. I need to go on the, uh, I need to discover the internet to see if, like, fan artists, in particular, I'm sure, like, uh, furries, you've got to de deliver on this. There's got to be fan art of Gulliver and the Winhams. If there's not, like, like, come on, like, you got some, like, some, I don't know, it just seems like something that we're, like, someone out there's got to be enough of an esoteric nerd that also has some art skills to go ahead and, uh, and, and draw this because the imagery of this is so absurd and ridiculous and it's to see this realistically depicted and like and i guess uh realized in like a straight-faced non-satirical manner it's got it's got to be like uh, such a great <laughs> such great like absurdist imagery but no 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 let's just keep rehashing the uh the oh look it's a he's a he's a normal person but he goes to an island where he's a giant amongst tiny people that is the size of ants like it's such a novel thing that um oh my goodness this is not this is this is not a hot run this is not a hot score we're gonna drag this up the points down again dog on it Okay, there we go. That was close. No, okay, we got at least one brick out of that. There we go. 25, 59, 60. Come on, can we get to... We got it. We only have one extra ball left, but can we get at least... We're half... We're... We're almost halfway between to getting to. We're, we're halfway to getting to 3,000. Well, we're more than halfway to getting to 3,000 now, but I mean, between. Since we scored the 2,000th point, we're more than halfway between. I mean, we're 2578. We're almost halfway to getting to the next 1,000. We can squeeze one more K out of this run. Oh, no, no, no. Okay, I, I talk too much. But at least we get to uh, resume the game with a full paddle now that the uh, more blocks are starting to uh, spawn. But now I could actually specifically try to aim. No, no, no. Didn't last. Now if that, if, if I had been able to, I guess, stall for a second more, I could have actually, the ball would have, wouldn't have ricocheted off the back of the court. And, uh, and, okay. Yeah, the, the nice thing is that now that the ball, the paddle is small, I don't even have to worry about trying to aim for the back of the court. I mean, to, I mean to, trying to aim not to hit the back of the court. Because every time we uh, either complete a stage... Hey, Jacob Aaron Bourgeoisie. Oh, come on, Twitch. It's like first time viewer from chat. Uh, there's You've been in chat before. Come on. What if the paddle was the same size of the ball? That would be ridiculous. In fact, what I think I think this is... I never played the original Breakout or the original Arkanoid. However, I will say that... Um, I guess like for an arcade machine like Breakout or Arkanoid, it's much fairer... Like, it makes more sense, because you're trying to squeeze quarters out of them, be as challenging as possible. 
There, I think at some point, either uh, possibly in Breakout, definitely I think in Arkanoid, that if the ball hits the back of the court, your paddle uh, reduces in size by one half. Uh, here, the paddle only reduces in size starting with stage uh, four. No, actually, no, stage five. Yeah, the ball only reduces in size starting at stage five. So the first few, like, training stages, I guess, that lets you hit the back of the... Oh, come on. This is so many, so much wasted time here. What a... Oh, come on. There we go. No! How could that... This is garbage. Come on, physics. This has nothing to do with lack of skill right here. I'm telling you. No! That was... Tr that was... That was terrible. That was terrible right there. That was really lame. Now, uh, fortunately, the bonus stage there, this is the rules of the bonus stage are the ball passes through bricks and clears them instantly instead of um, bouncing back off of them. And uh, you don't lose points for uh, when your ball uh, gets sent out of the court. Now, um, yeah, so, but for a handheld game, you've already cleared the... Oh my... The, 2790. That was that was sad. That was the first. That was the uh, 2790. Okay, so it's uh, 2790. No, no, no. The stream PB is 2990. 2790. Okay. 2790. I'm gonna add that 27. Just adding that into my off-screen spreadsheet, and now we're gonna add that into our calculator. Okay, that I have off-screen. Okay. Two seven nine zero. Two thousand three hundred thirty-six point five. So we're, that's 0.5. We're gonna round up to two three three seven. Is our new average? Two, three, three, seven. So that's the last run was the last go was really bad. So at least we've gotten we were able to uh, drag our average back up a little bit. So uh, we we'll, uh, continue. And actually, let me use this opportunity. I'm just gonna take a thirty second stretch break. Just get the blood flowing a bit. It's time for my Yoshi pillow. Okay, there we go. A little extra cushioning, and I should be good for the rest of the stream. All right. So we're just going to. Uh... There we go. Yeah. Now, like, uh, if I do, like, for every two hours, or two hours and change, if, if I'm, if I feel like, a, like a standard, if I do a standard four-hour stream, if I do more than four hours, it's extraordinary on weekdays, but for two hours, four-hour stream, two hours, I need to do, I need a ten-minute break, which I do halfway through the stream. Oh, no, I actually, excuse me, I, I said, I mean to update that, I, it, says, it says break in, it actually should say, I keep forgetting to do this, should it say end in? Because at that point, um, I am going to uh, end the. All right, hold on. I don't like that. Okay, we have to. It's sticking out a bit, and it's making my sticker look ugly. Oh, whatever. I'll fix it later. We're almost. It's only an hour left in the stream anyway. I like the ticker to be right up to that line right before it says end in, but that's just purely cosmetic. So actually, well, let's, I'm going to continue shaking off for the next 50 seconds. 
uh, and I'll start exactly on a uh, one hour left in the stream. I'll start this run now because I, the ball doesn't begin until I serve it. Uh, by the way, obviously I'm using the analog pocket. I'm using the uh, the 8 bit Doe SN30 gamepad. I was usually using a the USB connection because I th I felt like that was more reliable. I don't have to worry about interruption or disconnecting so much. But I was having I think there's something wrong with the cable. So I was having so I actually started using it wirelessly for the first time in a long time because the dock and the analog pocket dock does work uh, wirelessly. Now um, I'm going to okay nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. Three, two, one, and serve. Now, what was I getting at before I uh, had to get up and stretch for that that moment? Oh, alleyway! I think the name alleyway is referring to. Oh yeah, that's what I was saying before. The um, the fact that the see, look at see, like there are those bricks at the top of the screen that are only in the first like three stages, the th first three normal stages. I think that prevents my ball from hitting the back of the court, so I'm not penalized for having the ball hit, uh, strike the top of the screen. There, I guess these since these are just early. Tr now, but I don't think I feel like it's lame that the ball, um, the paddle shrinks when you hit the the back of the screen uh, in the later stages because, like the back of the court, it's a legitimate part of the play field. And this game is all about physics, use, bouncing the ball off of things. So why punish the player for bouncing the ball off the back of the court? Now, I think they're copying something out of Arkanoid, which I I've heard of for years, never actually played before. So if they're just copying Arkanoid, then I can see why they'd include that in the game. But in this, this is a... You've already got a um, the game about... You've already got, like sold the game at this point. Uh, and this game is very minimal in terms of music, in terms of uh, presentation. This almost this is a Game Boy launch game. I feel like almost like this is um, like something they threw together to test. Oh, that is embarrassing. The very first stage, like this is something they threw together that sort of just as a tech demo for the Game Boy. They ended up just just putting it together. Like even. Like, there's so little, even just a basic main musical theme, even if it repeated during every stage, probably would have been pre preferable to this. But I do, and people are really hard on this game. Uh, re modern reviewers of this game are, I tend to be very harsh on it. Um, especially, like, when this came out on the 3DS Virtual Console. But there's, there's, even though I did have the original model Game Boy, during its era, like b before the Play It Loud, before they even came out with the original model Game Boys in different colors, before Game Boy Pocket, I actually, I got my Game Boy in 95. I do, um, I, even in the 90s, I'd never heard of this game. I did not hear of this game. I did not know that there was a Nintendo published Breakout Arkanoid clone on Game Boy until, mm, until, well, until 2011. When the 3DS Virtual Console um, uh, service launched, now, oh, now that reminds me. Uh, uh so, I don't know the Nintendo's 3DS and Wii U eShop is not shutting down soon. I have to check the date. It's not shutting down, but they are taking away the ability to add money via like a credit card so you'll be able to add money to the wii u and 3ds eShop, but only through a a nintendo like eShop like gift card from a key uh, you cannot no longer will be able to add it via bank account or credit card now i don't know if that date's already come and gone or what but i do need to dump a bunch of money into the into the 3ds and wii u eShop before that deadline comes because there are a lot of uh, virtual console and uh, other and and they also need to find a good hard drive that's compatible with the Wii U. One that rec and the funny thing is, like if I look online for like a like, list of hard drives that work well with Wii U, the list you're going to get is a list of hard drives from like 2012 or 2013, and the technology has changed so much since then. A lot of those hard drives aren't even available anymore, like, unless you get a pre-owned one or something, and I want to get a new 
hard drive because I want to have a hard drive for all my Wii U, all my virtual console, and Wii U eShop stuff to be on so I don't have to worry about re-downloading it later if they ever actually fully deactivate the service. I guess theoretically, I guess I really should also look into what it takes to transfer my Wii... Uh, my, I have, like, tons of Wii Virtual Console stuff. I need to transfer it to Wii, the Wii U so I can just play it on a system that outputs native HD. Because I really was reluctant to uh, put that stuff, transfer that stuff over to the to the Wii U prior to... Because for a long time, I had... I did not have an HD tele monitor whatsoever until I started buying... Until I started streaming, really. Streaming was the reason I finally got an HD monitor. Not just an HD TV, but any HD screen whatsoever in my house. It was basically just to start streaming. And because I was still... I still have my CRT. It's in storage now in another state. But I, um... Because I still use my CRT for all my... Wii Virtual Console gaming stuff, I just liked having all that Virtual Console stuff on my original Wii so I could play those old, those 8, 16, 64-bit games on on the Wii's Virtual Console on a, on the monitor that they're originally meant to display on without lag or weird lighting issues or anything like that. Or brightness issues, rather, not lighting so much. No one, this, I'm, I'm happy to hear that no one in the stream has complained about the, my microphone quality, and, I mean, in terms of, uh, the, the last stream I did, it seems like every 30, 20 to 40 minutes, my microphone would start to act up, and it would sound like I was filtering my voice deliberately through, like, an app or something to make me sound like a weird, out-of-tune robot. And I'd have to unplug my ca my microphone and replug it back in, and it's a problem. I had problems like that in the past when I just got this microphone. Uh, no static, good, good, good. Yeah, I had problems in the past when I just gotten this microphone, which I've only gotten in like a, a fairly recently. I finally upgraded my mic because I was having problems with my uh my uh the microphone I started streaming with, and it's like, well, I got. I started with the, the cheapest. I started with the cheapest webcam I can get. I started with the cheapest microphone I can get. Uh, I didn't use stuff like a stream deck or anything like that because I didn't want to invest in a bunch of equipment. When I like, that's the funny thing about streaming. If you're not already set to go, if you don't already have a, a modern, a good, com a high per higher performance computer, if you don't have a webcam, capture card, all that kind of stuff. It's pretty expensive to get. In. It can be expensive to start streaming. And then you have to pay all this money, and potentially you could get into it and find out you don't even like it. So it was a real risk, even, uh, getting into this, because I had no way of knowing if I'd like this or not. But I'm having a great time, and I'm, and I'm uh, very fortunate and grateful for the community that I have. Um, the mic volume seems to be on the low end. I know, uh, we were adjusting the mic volume earlier. Um, uh, Clacka Boys, uh, said that they liked where my mic was at. Um, for this stream, because, uh, uh, if, uh, 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 Jacob Aaron Bourgeoisie, if your mic is, if your, is your volume, be it on headphones, or on your computer, or your television, whatever, if your volume is maxed out, and you can just barely hear me, then I would maybe consider cranking my, my personal, uh, mic volume up some. But for this, at least for this stream, because this isn't a stream where there's a lot of music or anything to balance with the background, as long as, like, my audio, as long as I, you don't have to crank up your volume to, like, max or anything like that, I would say maybe try just turning your own volume up or down, unless there's something else you're listening to, like background music or your own music or something, that or your own alerts on your computer, or you have to crank your vo the volume way up to hear me, and then your other alerts or whatever on your whatever device or way you're listening to this just blow out your eardrums or your speakers or whatever. Uh, no, um, yeah, because 
uh, for this stream and for the next one, I'm going to be, for the next stream, I'll press my button now for the, uh, the news update. Yeah, so I'll be playing about an hour of Alleyway. Then I'm going to switch over to reading uh, some vintage game magazines from the, uh, probably from the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, so because that stream won't be a bunch of, because it's not going to be a, um, have a, a great focus on balancing my voice with the game, I'm, my, I, I'm more just concerned with as long as you don't have to crank up my volume to, uh, your volume to hear me. For other streams that, like, for the stream after this, like, actually, let me pause. What's the stream after next? Let me take a look at my, uh, no, there's, uh, I'm not going to be streaming this Saturday. Next, uh, next stream is going to be the, uh, the Wednesday one. I, uh, just dropped the, uh, the alert about, um, but actually, actually, for the next two streams, there's not going to... Wow, the next stream that's going to have any significant amount of music is going to be on Saturday, the 22nd. If you look on the About page on my uh, my Twitch account, if you're on PC or uh, browser, uh, I have my streams right now listed through to the end of the month. On the Saturday, the 29th, I'm going to be playing Pokemon Legends Arceus. And that's actually the first stream I'm going to be doing... Really, since last week, last Saturday stream, it's gonna have any significant amount of music in it because next the the, the next Saturday stream I'm doing on Saturday the twenty second is going to be Commander Keen episode two, the Earth Explodes, which is which is an uh, early nineties DOS game. Therefore, there's not really a whole lot of music in it. There's really, there's really no music at all. It's just beeps and boops, and. Uh, Well, I know you've been, uh, it may have been a while since you, uh, chimed in in chat, but I know you've been watching for a long time, and, uh, I appreciate, uh, the patronage of everyone who's been, uh, watching, whether you're, uh, you know, you've made yourself known in chat, or if you, uh, are just, uh, keeping quiet and minding your business and hanging out in the background, I uh, appreciate it tremendously. Especially for a game like this, because honestly, this is not... And, like, the fact that I go back to my favorite games so frequently... And like, aside, like the most, the probably my most frequently streamed game has been, I'll count it as a single title, has been NES Pinball and like NES Pinball and Versus Pinball, which is not the most in-depth, super, um, uh, yeah, it's not a game that there's much to, it's just like a really, very basic kind of game. And this is more basic than doggone NES Pinball, so. He took a six month, a six month break from Twitch to really think about life. When you say a uh, break from Twitch, are you talking in terms of just viewing, or actually streaming? Because if you were a streamer, I was not hip to that. Or if I maybe I watched you and forgot about it, I don't think I would. I feel like if I saw you even once, uh, whether you're whether you use a face cam or if you're a mic, a mic only streamer or whatever. All together, you do not stream. Okay. Oh, cause I'll be I'll be frank with you. Um, I mean you you probably you sound like you figured it out for yourself. Um, Twitch can be a very addictive platform, even not just for, not so much for maybe streaming so much. I, I can see that being a thing too, but for, um, I can see Twitch being like addicted for streamers in terms of having unrealistic expectations of becoming a full-time professional streamer. I can see that being like a distraction from your life, your like productivity and, uh, and your actual personal life. But in terms of viewing, Twitch could be, I could see how it could be very insidious because there's such an emphasis on live interaction that if you know someone's on, or you know that someone's going to be on, and you're not there. You feel like you're missing out. It's not just enough to catch the VOD later. It's like, if a, if a, if you're looking at the chat in the VOD, and a chatter says something, you, oh, you and you want to respond to it. Or if you're watching your favorite streamer, and they say or do something, and I'm like, or they ask a question, and no one in chat knows the answer, and you're like, oh, I, could, I have something I could say about that, or oh, I could comment on that, or I could correct them, or help them. It's real. It can be very frustrating, and um, 
And then additionally, um, I guess, yeah, I guess that about is the, uh, the full extent of the bot. And then when it comes to VODs, you can, if you follow a dozen people and they all stream several times a week and they stream for four to six or more hours each stream, that's dozen, that quickly totals up to dozens of hours of material and you want to catch up on all of it, be, catch the birth of a new, the, new, the newest end joke or meme or whatever. And trying to catch up on those VODs could be even more insidious and disruptive to your life than trying to catch them everyone live all the time. And uh, so, Clackaboy, that's how you, you feel about your streams? I'm really honored because you're, you know, you're one of my earliest, uh, uh, I know you're a, you're a pre-Twitch, um, yeah, I know you're, you're pre-Twitch with your history with uh, viewing my material, but you're one of my earliest Twitch viewers and uh, one of the uh, most frequent uh, viewers, most frequent chatters. So I appreciate you tremendously, but uh, don't ever feel too stressed out about um, about um, catching my, uh, my my stuff live or whatever. Because honestly, I did not... I don't know. I didn't know what to expect. I had no specific expectations. I didn't expect to blow up and become like an overnight sensation or any or an internet celebrity or anything silly like that. But I also didn't really have any expectations that in playing the kinds of stuff I like and going back to my my favorites like Sonic the Hedgehog, like versus Pinball, like this right here, which is only actually this is only the second time I've gone back to the first time I've gone back to it on stream you know what I wonder should I include I wonder if I should if, if I could I could go back to my the 20 minute the, the sessions I played in my um my analog pocket uh, variety stream the, the, the test streams I wonder if, if I could go back and look at all my scores, scores from there and include them in this set of data that would be interesting Uh, I've been pl I can't believe I've been playing for 17... This particular game has already been 17 minutes long. 35, 36, come on, just one. No, I didn't get it. I got it for a, a single frame. I was trying to get it to 1,337 points and have the, uh, the, cool, the cool score. And I could say with confidence, I know absolutely that I am the only person right now, right now, this stream is the only coverage whatsoever this game has on Twitch, including VODs and pre-recorded material that's been uploaded. There is absolutely zero material for this game on Twitch right now. And I am one of the 70 people out of like hundreds of thousands of millions of people, well, millions, because it has to be millions of people because there are people with more than a million subscribers on uh, our viewer or uh, followers on twitch right of uh, the millions of users on twitch i am one of only like 70 something who actually follows the twitch category for this game which i am not streaming under myself the only time i've ever seen anyone stream under this category it's well once it was because they were streaming like retro uh achievements and we're just going for as many achievements as they can get in any random games and then the other time was, um, well, actually it was a couple of times where I go and, uh, is there an arcade version of this game? Now, um, hold on. Now, this game is, I'm going to start the bonus stage in a second, but I'm going to pull up something on YouTube. We're not going to watch it. I don't want to take the views away from him, even though I'm, it's only like, what, five or six people watching. Uh, Game Boy... Or it's alleyway. There we go. Mario retrospective remastered. Um, yeah, so here's a little sort of mini documentary about this game made by Jeremy Parrish on YouTube. You can see the history of this game. It has a unique history with Nintendo and with Intelligent Systems, who went on to develop the Paper Mario game. Actually, this is the second Intelligent Systems developed game that we featured. But now, but this game, Alleyway, the Nintendo published game developed by Intelligent Systems, who was effectively a Nintendo second party, they never, um, they never, this game never released in arcades. 
but this game is a rather blatant ripoff of a very famous arcade of a famous arcade game called Breakout, which I believe is by Atari. And the and Taito made a sort of enhanced take on this block breaking uh, ping pong video game concept called Arkanoid, which I believe had some some more science fiction type elements, had some introduced some elements like power ups that changed a, that transformed how the ball would, would handles or how the paddle uh, works. They have power ups that could I think make the paddle bigger or smaller, things like that. But um. Now, uh, now I keep, I kept, I was getting at this thought a couple of times earlier in the stream, I never completed it. However, I was thinking of ideas for, um, Game Boy versus Game Gear streams, the sort of, the, the handheld arch rivals of the early 90s. And the one idea I had was to have a stream where, like, the more, most obvious example is two hours of Super Mario Land followed by uh, two hours of Sonic the Hedgehog on Game Gear. Excuse me, I have to... I'm trying to find... Some, okay, there we go, there we go. All right, we're good, we're good. Yeah, two hours of Super Mario Land, followed by two hours of Sonic the Hedgehog on Game Gear. So the two... The premier mascot platformers on handheld Nintendo and Sega devices from the same time period. Uh, but the idea I had was for... um. The other idea is there's a game, uh, Pete Dorr actually, I don't know if he still holds a record on it, he played the Genesis version of this game called Devilish. And if you look, you hear the game called Devilish, and if you look at the box art, it looks like a really sinister kind of game that might be about, you know, the occult or, or devil worship or something. When you play the game, it's actually a game kind of like this. It's a game about a, uh, a young couple that are in love and a devil called known as uh, Y, just the letter Y, appears from the earth and transforms them both into stone paddles. The only way they can be transformed to their original selves is for them to guide a magic crystal orb through courses of enemies and obstacles uh, by, uh, by um, the player maneuvering the, the two paddles, the two stone paddles, which are the transformed, uh, I guess, uh, a prince and princess. And to guide the ball through the stage and defeat uh, giant uh, evil boss monsters. And there's a Game Gear version of Devilish I've never actually seen in action before. And I'd love to... If you're going to compare a Game Boy... I'm sure there's a Game Gear version of Arkham Boy. That would be a more fair comparison. But if you're going to... If you want to be really unfair to Game Boy. Make it look as trashy and primitive as possible. How about comparing uh, this game... To the Game Gear version of Devilish. And the cool thing about Devilish is, Devilish, you're not just bouncing a ball around a single screen court like this. Devilish is a take on this where you have a pa two paddles, one on the X and Y axis, respectively. And as you manipulate those paddles, you're actually guiding the ball through a course from point A to point B, at the, at the end of which you face a boss. So it's kind of actually a fusion between this uh, breakout Arkanoid style single screen score attack gameplay and something more like Super Mario Brothers or Sonic the Hedgehog where you're guiding a oh man we got the we got the oh the hype we're bouncing the ball it's going crazy we've got the momentum going we've got oh that was so cool that was so cool oh I'm so happy that happened uh, we've got the that is the max it's max alleyway action right there Oh, we, I, I gotta clip that one later. That was cool. Oh, we're almost... The ball's about to actually uh, enter the lower play field again. <laughs> that's the... That's, this is why this is my favorite course in the game, actually. It's because the way the, the, the block pattern is, like, staggered. So you have that potential to really get that ball in the, in the nook, or the alleyway, I guess, is it's supposed to be called. Now, of course, the conceit of this is that you're supposed... This is supposed to be a spaceship, this paddle. That Mario is piloting through a, a corridor of the what they called in the, the game the vid grid. And we're, we're cruising through the galactic alleyway. And it's like, yeah, it's just a breakout point. It's like not... It's not... 
It's not that serious. They just sort of contextualize this by having Mario jump in and out of the paddle. And they show him on the box art, but it's not. This is back when Nintendo, any team within Nintendo, could throw Mario into whatever they wanted. And it, there really wasn't any formalities involved. No, like, style guide where you can't... They, like, back then, you could just frivolously use Mario, and, an, and anyone within Nintendo or the Nintendo Second Party could frivolously just throw Mario into whatever they wanted with really little complication. Whereas nowadays, like, the I, 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 it's so unfortunate. The Mario, like, the Mario franchise now has suffered tremendously from homogeny and standardization. Oh, no, the cover art is really cool. And, in fact, the Japanese version of this cover art does not include Mario, I believe. The character in the in the uh, in the spaceship, in the Japanese version, is actually just a generic guy in an astronaut suit. The the idea to add Mario to the cover art was something they did for the North American localization. And what was I getting? At? The Mario franchise, I believe, has suffered from so much homogeny and standardization that, like in the first Paper Mario, you got all kinds of cool characters inhabiting the game world you had original uh characters like the uh the different uh unique uh versions like like a uh, bombette the bob the female the pink female bob -omb. or um or the uh the female um archaeologist spelunker goomba goombet or whatever her name is in um in uh, Paper Mario Thousand Year Door, you have the Sailor bob um Well, you have the the Coop the Koopa Troopa with the uh, the blue shell, um, Cooper, I believe. The, you have the the Postman uh, Paratroopa, and and you have en unique enemies like Tubba Blubba and Two Tank Koopa, the Egyptian Pharaoh themed uh, Koopa Troopa boss, and. Uh, you, and the thing is, now they're not allowed to have original characters like that. N like, now all the characters have to just be standard enemies. And it got to the point where in the latest Paper Mario game, all the enemies are, like, photorealistic representations of art supplies, like staplers and colored pencils, that are not anthropomorphized in any way, shape, or form, but have dialogue. Because, oh, it's not a character, it's just a box of colored pencils. Because they... To write around the fact that they can't create these original boss characters anymore, like Mario's partners that he travels with aren't customized in any way. You don't get like Bob, like like Bobbery the Sailor Bob Om. Now you just get a, a plain looking Bob Om called Bob Om, and it's like ridiculous. And because like they're not allowed to do things like that in Paper Mario games now, and in fact the um kind of looks like Mario's depend defending the planet. I guess like in the way they wrote this. Actually, let me, uh, let, actually, let's clear the stage, and we'll, we'll, we'll have a bonus stage after this, but before I trigger the bonus stage to begin, well, before we serve the ball there, let me read the back of the, uh, the copy. And then, even worse, well, in, like, Mario and Luigi, like, Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga, they have, like, a unique, like, logo for the game, they have a unique art style, this unique watercolor art style for Mario and Luigi, and some of the defining characteristics of... Some of the defining characteristics of the Mario and Luigi art style is that Mario and Luigi have red and white striped socks. And for, for whatever reason, it just happened to be that the M and the L on Mario and Luigi's caps are just black instead of red. So when you see Mario and Luigi in that watercolor art style with the striped socks and the black letters on insignias on their hats, you knew that, hey, it's Mar the Mario and Luigi art style. When they re-released Mario and Luigi's Superstar Saga, Nintendo made Alpha Dream Photoshop the original artwork to, to they lengthened Mario and Luigi's pants to cover up their striped socks, and they photo they photoshopped their hats to have like to be red and green for the insignias on their hats instead of black. And it's like Nintendo's literally censoring their own artwork of past games to enforce the homogeny that they decided is essential to the Mario brand survival and it's really despicable it's really unfortunate in my opinion but let me read hold on alleyway Game Boy Box I want to read the back cover of alleyway before I start this bonus stage here um yeah okay 
No, no, no. We're gonna, okay. Now, the back of the box reads, Interstellar Ping Pong with a Deadly Energy Ball. Your spaceship is at the gate of the alleyway. Use your vessel to repel the energy ball. Atomize space grids with your return shots. Destroy the entire field and move on to even more challenging targets. You're in command in the alleyway. So they wrote this copy like you're in a spaceship or whatever. They're just trying to cover the fact that it's just like a... And then they tried to tie in the inclusion of Mario a bit closer. But let's uh, continue on. We only have a half hour left. So let's see if we can beat the high score. Uh, maybe uh, bring up our, uh, our average just a little bit. Oh, we got that was a that was a really risky shot I took there. I was like one pixel away from having that shot just sort of. All right, we're we're making good progress. I don't lose points when if the ball if I miss the ball or if I run out of time. These are all free points here, pretty much. But I uh, I get a huge cache of bonus points if I uh, can clear the board in time. I don't think I'll be able to this time. It's very easy to get stuck in a in a sort of uh, stuck in a loop where I can barely knock the ball really anywhere unique. I just keep, like, no matter how hard I try, just it seems like it, the ball keeps going down the same trajectory over and over. And this is the third, fourth, no, third time we've gotten this far. Uh, and this is the... Um, this is the, let's see, this is the one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six. This is the seventh game uh, so far in this session. And, excuse me, excuse me, go away. Okay. This is the seventh game so far in this session. The uh, six games that are included in the current average. Uh, if I feel like it, I'll go back to my, uh, this was the first game I played with the analog pocket, which I'm, uh, for transparency's sake, I'm playing using the 8-bit Doe gamepad. I'm playing with it wirelessly because I was having problems with my USB cable. Because I like the wired connection. It just gives me more peace of mind knowing I'm, I'm not going to have any weird disconnects or anything. But the, uh, I think there's something wrong with my USB cable. It was a, this is, The cable I was using with my controller was the same one I was using last stream on Saturday when I kept having weird problems where every 20 to 40 minutes I'd have... No! Okay, that was close. I was like one frame or two away from losing the ball right there. Oh, man. High score. High score territory. We are definitely dragging. At this point, we are guaranteed to be... Oh, 3,000. We've broken the 3,000 barrier. And each time we uh, clear another 1,000, we get an extra ball. We get another ball back. So we're doing great right now. I'm kind of... Yeah, I'm really blown away that I am uh, have this kind of... Now... This kind of uh, response to a game so plain, even for a Game Boy launch game, this is not much to look at or to listen to. Um, so I'm, I'm collecting data on this as I go. Uh, so you can see my current stats there. I'm also, uh, I also have this in a... Uh, I should use a spreadsheet instead I'm using a text document. Now the scoring system is pretty simple. Uh, one, pa one brick uh, cleared equals one point added to your score pretty simple right however uh the only time that is not the case is in the bonus stage if you uh, manage to clear the entire court before time runs out and obviously without losing a ball as well you will get either f a, f a bonus 500 or a bonus 1000 points i forgot which it's either 500 or a thousand that's the only scenario in this game in which one point earned is not doesn't rep reflect one block cleared which means that so far because i did start this this session with uh exactly an hour left on the clock to the end of the stream so that means we've cleared three thousand one hundred and oh what this is the first time we've gotten to this stage this is going to be a cool stage this is going to be a cool stage all right if we can get some good uh alleyway action and in... in this we can sneak the ball up there and have it bounce tear through the top that would be a really fun uh, action to to get through now okay that's one nice thing is the ball does not serve until you press uh the uh the button the uh 
Yeah, the B button. And uh, for full disclosure, now, um, okay. I just want to make this clear. I'm playing on the analog pocket. This green screen effect uh, to simulate the screen of the original model Game Boy, this is not part of the analog pocket, nor is the Game Boy frame. This is just a static image I, I found on the internet that I uh, just soup that I just uh, have the uh, the game capture running on the inside. Sadly, it seems like not just the Mario franchise, but a lot of stuff is like that these days. Now, let me find... Uh, that's what Jacob Bourgeoisie said. Um, now, let me find... Where is... I just want to show. Just so I, I'm clear what, with everyone what's going on. Um, where is... Where's my green screen filter? Here we go, here we go. Yeah, so that's what the game actually looks like. That's what I'm seeing on the monitor directly in front of me. But on the broadcast software, I just turn the filter on. Now what this filter, now on the actual analog pocket, there are all kinds of cool filters to make it, you could cause the screen, you can either have it look perfect, like have that perfect white like I, you saw. You could have it look like you're viewing it on a Game Boy Pocket. You could have it look like you're viewing it on a, um, you could have it look like you're viewing it on an original model Game Boy with the cabbage green screen. And that effect on the system itself is much more effective than what I've uh, sort of cobbled together using my broad... Oh, here we go. Here we go. This is this is what I like to see. This is what I... This is what... I, that was what I was hoping for. Oh, boy. That was fun. Yeah. This is what I was... Man, I almost wish these levels were introduced sooner in the game. Jeez. Woo! Yeah, back into play you go. Because the uh, the ricochet ob obstacles are permanent in this stage, this is almost better than my other favorite stage. Now, um, yeah, the when you're looking at it on the screen, the effect is much more uh, vivid and convincing than what I've cobbled together using my broadcast software. Yeah, you can have it look like a Game Boy Pocket. You can have it look perfect like this. You can have it look like um. A Game Boy Light, which is a Japan-only uh, uh, system, sort of based on Game Boy Pocket, but it's not the same. It uses AA instead of AAA batteries. It's slightly larger than Game Boy Pocket. And this cool thing about the Game Boy Light screen is that the the front light on that screen is basically like the front light of an of like a '90s digital watch, where it's kind of this frosty green effect that looks really, really cool in the dark. And uh, that even for years, like I wanted the Game Boy, I considered importing a Game Boy Light at the high price it goes for, just to be able to play games with that cool, not just with a light, but with that cool frosty green effect on the screen. And, uh, but now you can simulate that with the uh, Game Boy Pop, with the Game Boy, uh, you can simulate that with um, the analog pocket system, but not when it's in the dock. Not when it's in the dock, because in the dock, um, it just looks like the plain view like I look. Now, how I made this filter. Now, I feel real clever for doing this. All I did, I just went into GIMP, which is kind of like a Photoshop alternative. I just made a green P, like .png image file, imported that into my broadcast software, then turned like down the, the uh, opacity on the uh, image. Uh, to, so it's transparent, and then I mess with the filter effects a bit to get this green effect. The uh, it's not quite as cool as I. Hopefully, in future versions of the analog pocket, um, future versions of the analog pocket uh, uh firmware. If not the um, either the it's I guess it's either gonna have something to do with the firmware or the console itself. Hopefully, there will be versions. Uh. uh uh, updates that allow you to use those different screen filters so that when you're viewing on a monitor like I am you can enjoy those kind of uh, period accurate effects uh, that are uh, unique to different uh, hardware editions but th I have faith that they might because they have a lot of weird sort of esoteric options for most important to me and this is something when they first announced the analog pocket that I was wondering about is the the fact that you can for dual mode Game Boy and Game Boy Color titles you have the option to for, to boot them into black and white monochrome Game Boy mode. I wonder, I just thought of this. I wonder if each stage has the same number. Oh, doggone. 
I wonder if each stage has the same number of points to be scored in it. I wonder. Jacob Adam Borges, I like how you know a lot of friend you, like you know how a lot of franchises and stuff and stuff used to have more charm and originalness. Now things are more generic, and I think one uh, I think going back to Mario, I people are, I mean are very frustrated with the new Super Mario Brothers series. I think I mean honestly, if you look really at the core games, there was basically only one new Super Mario Brothers game per system between Game Boy, no, I mean, between DS, Wii, 3DS, and Wii U. I mean, if you can, New Super Luigi U, yeah, I got a retail release, but that was just sort of a gimmick for the year of Luigi thing. But, um, like, that was re really DLC for New Super Mario Brothers U. So if you look at four main, four New Super Mario Brothers games, one per system. That's a one per console release, just like Mario Kart, just like Smash Brothers. But because they released, because the games look so similar, because three of the four games recycle the same soundtrack, because um, the two later games... Oh, doggone. 3382. All right. So I'm just going to add that to... And we were playing that for... An, an, including pause time for 40... That was a 40-minute session. Doggone. We, were played, we played that one game for 40 minutes. Okay, so... So, 33.82, which is con very convenient because it happens to be the top score on the cartridge. Because this game does not save your high score, so we have to keep this, uh, keep notes of this. So, 33.82, and we're going to update our, okay, so high score, 33.82. Recent and, and it's the stream stream PP. Yeah, that's a great thing. When I get a high score, I guess it uh, all three all three numbers get updated at once. Now, so we're gonna add thirty three eighty two into our average. Let me do this math real quick. No, no, no. Okay, here we go. Okay. No, no, no. Okay, so, okay. Some. Okay. 2485 point, big number. 20, we're just going to make it 2485. Hold on. My average is now 20. 4. 8. Five. Hold on, I have to look. Okay, two, three, three, seven. Two, three, three, seven. So I have to hold on. I want to calculate something else. Two, three, three, seven. Excuse me, I would have had this calculator... I'm going to have this calculator ready to go next time. I didn't think about... Alright. Two, three, three, seven, and what is the other number? 24... No, 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 that's not... No, I need to go... 2485. So 2485. And. All right. So that last. That last. Thanks, everybody. So we improved our. That. So that's. Okay. Actually, I'm going to add this to the. So that's plus. Sorry, I have too many tabs and stuff open. So that's plus. So that's an improved that last um that last game. Dr that p improved our average score. 
by six a bit for by uh, by six percent. Now we only have 50 minutes left to play, so what I'm gonna do this game just getting that far. Even if I don't pause or anything, we'll take at least 15 minutes. I mean, it will take more than 15. So I'm just going to play. Okay. No resets. I have to stick with whatever happens. No resets. Unless. Like, I've even, I'm even counting, like, you know, when controller, my controller unplugged and disconnected. I'm counting that in there. I'm counting my entire extreme experience, whether I'm distracted or whatever. But that all factors in because I'm only going to include scores in my average that were at that were attained while I was streaming. And in fact, I might even... This is like one of my favorite games to play when I'm like... When I uh, play uh, casually on my own. Because actually... Actually, since I got my analog pocket... Um, really for the first time ever, I'm actually uh, playing games casually. And that's usually alleyway here. I'm only gonna... I wonder if I should even uh, play off stream anymore. If that's gonna skew my results... A certain way, but there's the fact that I'm playing. I'm only gonna include. I, I might play off stream casually, but I might. Um, I'm only gonna include uh, pr scores that were achieved while I was um, while I was streaming. Now, uh, uh, Mega Kong was. Uh, he already sent it to me. Um, the fact that the uh, the light on the uh this game boy layout isn't the power indicator light isn't on it was bothering uh kyle tx 500 a great streamer by the way does lots of uh, rapid fire variety stuff of uh original playstation and lately xbox as well um he apparently from what i heard went and made a edit of this that actually makes it look like the uh the power indicator light is on on the game boy frame and i've already been sent an image to import into here I tried to do that myself. I use, like, GIMP and Photoshop, whatever. I'm not very talented in it. I use it for the things I use it for. Now, Borges, he was saying, I like how those little intro videos in this game are totally not just the computer automatically moving the paddle. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I didn't realize this. Apparently... How, like, in the attract mode for Super Mario Brothers, on when you play it, when you run that game on an original NES, like, the attract mode for the first game actually, like, grabs the mushroom and stomps on a Goomba, I think. But then if you let it run, like, the second time around, like, Mario will miss the mushroom, he'll run a, a bit against a block, I think, and he'll get struck by the mushroom and end up falling into a pipe, into a hole, or something like that. And he doesn't play very well, but the first time it seems more like he's properly playing. Apparently, that actually has to do something to do with like the NES console on the most like fund on like the electrical engineering level of how the game works and how the electrical components components of the NES and the game program actually work. Where it actually has to like pl it actually plays into like the whole concept of the frame rule system. Which is something you'll hear a lot about if you follow the Super Mario Brothers speed running scene. We can only beat the game in certain increments because the game is counting, only counts to see if Mario's completed a stage every certain number of fractions of a frame or something crazy like that, or every so many frames with the game running at 60 frames per second. And it's very easy to forget that a lot of these early 8 bit games do run at 60 frames per second. And, and when you get to as recently as, like, the PS3 generation, like, a game running at 60 FPS was a big deal. Because once games got more complicated and we were running, dealing with having to render 3D polygons in real time, that actually is what brought the frame rate back down to, to you know, in the, into the 30s and such. Where get aiming for that 60 frames per second again with modern 3D games was actually sort of a new benchmark. Whereas these early 8-bit games, even though the hardware had less computational capability, the programs that were running, the simulations that were running, were so simple that uh, they were actually running 60 frames per second, no problem. But, uh... But, yeah, apparently the fact that the second go... Oh, but you've let the title screen, Super Mario Brothers, run around a second time, the fact that that attract mode 
um, hangs. Oh my gosh, that the attract mode, uh, sort of Mario sort of fumbles around the second time has to do with the way they programmed in the inputs for how the attract mode is supposed to run. Um, I guess it just doesn't run as intended or something the second time around because of like the timing of the frame rules or something to do with the game on an electrical engineering level. I mean, we're gonna run out the timer, but we're gonna play out this game. All right, and oh, there we go, there we go. Just gonna get it back up. No, 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 not quite. You got a, a little, some nice ricochet action there. And of course, I mean, it plays more into the later levels where you saw how the, the panels were disappearing as they got closer to the bottom of the court. And uh, I was losing, they were vanishing. So yes, the blocks are vanishing in the sense that I'm closer to uh, defeating the level because once all the blocks are clear, the level ends, the next stage begins automatically. But I'm losing the opportunity to earn those points. I feel like I was, like sometimes I feel like you could really see the game sort of struggle with the de collision detection logic they programmed into it, where the game will maybe almost clip through a block a bit. But the thing is, when the clipping happens, like the clipping happens graphically, you can see the graphics clipping. But usually, I think actually always, frankly, the physics of the ball, like, like it doesn't feel like I got cheated out of... Um, so if I can't... I can get one more point if I can get clear this block in time. I don't think I can, though. Okay, so... Yeah, I don't feel like the game's ever cheating me. I feel like I'm... Uh, I feel like even when the ball clips or whatever, it clips. Or if the game has to decide which side of a block or which side of my pedal the ball is on, it seems to be choosing fairly. It's not like, oh, that, that should have been in, but the game just sort of arbitrarily decided to like oh it, it sort of cheated me and i you know what i just thought of that i guess it's more important for if the ball clips or if there's unclear de collision detection for that to be handled reliably uh, that's so good actually they could have very easily been lazy about this and had the game ship just as fine with a slightly wonky collision detection oh no come on come on i'm so close so close with a slightly uh questionable collision detection I think that's, I almost will accept, I think, the unfair aspect of the ball not really loading, or not really, um, I guess you could say, um, uh, not really, I guess the fact that the paddle, like, automatically halves in size, I guess that's worth it. I would rather have a, the paddle half in size for hitting the, uh, the top of the court, than just keep, uh, rebooting or rather than to be cheating me out of uh, out of out of balls because I feel like it's handling de collision detection in an unreliable or uh, Azure says it, saying you're enjoying this game way too much. Honestly, I'm shocked that I've had the kind of act the sort of support in terms of viewership and chat activity with this game because this game is probably the least visually interesting game I've ever played. The only thing I could say that is less visually interesting to look at than this is uh, Pachinko for the SG-1000, which I played as a joke for 10 or 11 hours straight during my uh, 3DS retrospective, looking at my all my old YouTube videos related to the Nintendo 3DS. H, do I ever struggle with FOMO in terms of streaming or in terms of playing games or in what, like in what context specifically? Because there are some ways that maybe yes, like I've had to accept that, that like there's some like new release games. This is before streaming where it's like, I, I know a game is cool. I want to be part of the conversation, but I know I don't care that much. Uh, the last game I really bought like that I mean, arguably Smash Brothers Brawl, 
not a Smash Brothers Brawl, Smash Brothers for 3DS, but I had a specific reason I wanted to get that, and I guess it based pretty much fulfilled that reason, because I was still in college when Smash Brothers for uh, 3DS came out. Now, I was way over age for college at that point in terms of a bachelor's degree, but, you know, I still had friends I was hanging out with on campus and whatever, and yeah, they had 3DS, they were all big Smash heads, so it's like, okay, I get a 3DS, I can play Smash with them, fine, whatever. But, um... Uh, FOMO, like, uh, like, Kid Icarus Uprising. I was really interested in that game, you know, it's the first Kid Icarus game in, like, 25 years. And I got it, and I played maybe two or three hours into it. I, I loved, I appreciated that game in the sense that it used every aspect available of what the, what, it used the, the touchscreen. I mean, you could argue how effective they were using, you, how effective the touchscreen was and the implementation of those controls, but... They use the touch screen. They use the dual screens. They use the 3D. They use the AR cards. They use the local wireless. They use the online Wi-Fi wireless uh, online multiplayer. They used every aspect of the 3DS. They use the cameras for the uh, augmented reality. They used everything that system had to offer. I loved. I appreciated that game so much. There's so much polish. So many options. That risk reward system that they later uh, implemented in Smash Brothers for 3DS and Wii U. Um, uh, but I only played it for a couple of hours and I kind of got bored of it. And at that point, I was like, you know what? I'm not, if I know, I get, I pretty much predicted I wouldn't be that into it, but I was interested in being part of the conversation and whatever. Frankly, I, that game was almost worth it for the 3DS stand. I used that 3DS stand for the, basically the rest of the time I owned 3DS. Whenever I was playing 3DS and, um, like, uh, at my job that I had earlier on in the 3DS's lifespan and things like that. Like, whenever I was at a table, whenever I played 3DS at a table, whether at home or on the go, if I was car if I ha had a backpack, I would use that stand. I thought the stand was great. Now, I know um, uh, Yahtzee from Zero Punctuation, or if I'm can, or yeah, Yahtzee's review of Kid Icarus Uprising, he went on, he keep going on rants about the stand, about how Kid Icarus Uprising was such a, I can, I agree that the controls weren't well implemented, but he kept railing against the game for including a stand. And he's like, oh, and it's not even portable because you have to use the stand every time you play it. I'm like, you don't have to use the stand. And the stand improves the ergonomics of every 3DS game. Any game, whenever you're using the 3DS on a table, the stand was nice to have. So. I'm better at being okay that I can't. Yeah, like, I had to accept that, hey, I can't play every, like, right now. And for the rest of my life, I can never purchase another video game. I can only play, I can only stick with games I own the disc or cartridge of, or games that I have downloaded to my various video game systems. If that's all I had for the rest of my life, I don't think I'd ever be bored. And that's a surreal thing to say. It really puts a lot of things into perspective. The fact that I'm planning on more games to play, and that I want to play on stream or whatever. But, yeah, that's true. If I never purchased another video game again, I'd have enough... I'd never be bored. I'd have enough to play between old favorites and every once in a while play something I downloaded or play or purchased years ago, be it a retro game or a relatively more modern game from the last two or three generations. I'd, I don't think I'd ever be bored again. Um, now, uh, but... Yeah. So, like, yes, for Pokemon Legends Arceus, I don't play... A lot of more recent games, like the last modern game I played on stream, I mean, not counting Metroid Dread, which was only for a single stream and only for a couple of hours, that did not go well. If I return to that game, it'll be off stream, but I'm going to record it as a Let's Play, just because I'm interested to see if I could... Like, uh, my experience with Metroid Dread is interesting in ways that I want to document and maybe make some more in-depth videos about. Because... I think there's a certain amount of outrage or knee-jerk, like, negative reactions towards anyone who played that game and had a negative experience in terms of having it being too difficult to play. And I've seen lots of people being accused of being fake gamers or, or being, like, bad gamers or being casuals. Or if they said, hey, I, I, oh, I was so excited for this game and they played it and couldn't play it, they're like, oh, you're not even a real Metroid fan or you never played a Metroid game before. And I think that there's a lot of complexity to that. I don't think an experience quite like mine has really been documented in any level of detail. 
like like dread was a game i like and part of my documentation of it i want to clip like this the footage i mean mecha kong you were there the moment metroid dread got revealed now and i was so exci excited for it and then i was and i had certain concerns and i played it and those concerns were realized i wasn't able to play the game very well and i've even had i mean uh, i i'm someone who remained unnamed in the metroid community uh, when, uh, when I rate it, like, I've had more viewers during Metroid Dread than I think I ever had outside of the, maybe the E3 stream. And I felt bad, because all these people obviously want to see someone's impression of the game. I'm having a bad experience, and I wanted to... I, listen, I want to send you to, an, uh, like, an enthusiast, someone who's probably going to have a much better time with Metroid Dread than me. So I rated someone in the Metroid community who will remain unnamed, and... I rated them, and they're like, and I was kind of, the reason I rated them is because I was surprised by how few, how relatively few viewers they had, right? And there we go with that tick again, that right thing. But anyway, I was surprised by how few viewers they had, given that there's someone I know of in the metric community. I thought they'd have a lot more, more, uh, uh that's the end of the, t that's time, but I'm going to play out the end of this round. And what I did was I, um, so I rated them, you know, oh, thanks, you know, uh, I was talking to them, they're like, oh, what do you think of the game, the streamer? And I was like, oh, I'm really, you know, I've been incredibly disappointed, and, you know, I, but I know it's the game, it's not, it's me and not the game. I've been really disappointed with, you know, the way it controls and everything. And they, like, kind of low-key told me off. They're like, oh, well, don't come in here just to bash the game. And I'm like, it's, I didn't say this to them. I was just kind of shocked that they had that reaction. I'm like, excuse me, I'm bringing stream, I'm bringing my viewers to your stream to boost your numbers, specifically because I was surprised by how few viewers you had. First off, and because I had more viewers than they did at the time, and for someone, I mean, I would have previously said that I think that they deserve those viewers more than I did. And aside from that, the fact that I'm bringing them into your stream specifically so that they could see someone who's experienced with Metroid games and more talented at games than me have a good time with the game, because I really felt bad that people were watching my stream more than I, viewers than I normally have and watching me have a bad time with the game. And you're going to tell me off on stream for bashing the game? Yeah, okay, sure. But anyway, um, all that is... So that's the last modern game I played. But, like, actually, no, excuse me. I forgot all about Mario Party Superstars. Which is, you know, a game I only played a few times, unfortunately. And that's going to be one of those semi-regulars I want to keep come back to here and there. After whatever does or doesn't happen with Metro with um, Pokemon Legends Arceus... Which is, uh, the Saturday the 29th, I'm going to be streaming Pokemon Legends Arceus, uh, starting at 2, for four or more hours, hopefully. And, um, uh, that is, uh, it's interesting, there are a lot of moving pieces with Pokemon Legends Arceus. Frankly, it, it, Pokemon Legends Arceus is modern Pokemon's last chance to convince me to, uh, spend my money on a, and time on a modern Pokemon game. Because I've been a Pokemon fan, I've been interested in Pokemon since the first time I saw it in the pages of EGM2, this off this blurb mentioning, oh, there's this Game Boy game called Pocket Monsters, where you're catching and battling monsters, and there are two versions of the game you have to trade to get all of the entire uh, collection of monsters. I'm like, oh, that sounds interesting. It sounds really Japanese, so I don't think they'll ever bring that to the U.S. And you decided to skip Elden Ring doing, you know, you love it, and you're getting Arceus instead. Okay. Now, um... This next ball is going to be game unless I could uh, score another uh, couple hundred points and roll us over to a t two thousand before I I miss my next I miss, mi before the next time I miss a ball. But uh, yeah, Pokemon Legends Arceus. It is um, modern Pokemon because I really feel like Pokemon Sword and Shield severely lacked polish, severely lacked effort. It was frankly kind of embarrassing some of the corners that were cut with that game. And I don't think a, a, mod, a po mainline Pokemon or I mean, a mainline Mario or Zelda game po developed by Nintendo would never be allowed to ship with the sort of corners that were cut with, with Pokemon Sword and Shield. And I've been called a, a, a hater. I've been called a toxic fanboy. I've been called like a, a fake Pokemon fan for saying that. But that's just my honest opinion. And and I'm, I'm saying that as someone who is defending Pokemon Sword and Shield for a good decent amount of time into its development until it became clear to me 
that what, what Game Freak was choosing to show off of the game was not reflecting the kind of promises and claims that Game Freak was making, let alone the standard expectations for what a, any game on an HD system should be like, especially a game p published by Nintendo. You were surprised I didn't get the Diamond and Pearl remake? I'm gonna say this, Diamond and Pearl remake, if Diamond and Pearl, if Brilliant Diamond Shine, uh, Shining Pearl was the first ever Pokemon remake, I would have gotten it, I would have been perfectly happy with it. However, Diamond, the Pokemon Diamond and Pearl remakes for Nintendo Switch, in comparison to every previous po the previously released Pokemon remake, is offering significantly less. It lowers the bar, it lowers the standards, and I'm not spending my time and money on that. And it's especially a shame because of all the mainline Pokemon games, um, Diamond and Pearl were the only ones I never played the original versions of, and I'd probably rather play the original versions. I'll, I'll play a ROM of Pokemon uh, Platinum before I play Dim Shining uh, Diamond and Pearl, whatever they call it. I do not want to... Or if I, if anything, I'll buy a pre-owned uh, physical copy of uh, the Diamond and Pearl remakes because I do not want to spend my money on that. I'm not saying it's probably a perfectly competent game, de not developed by Game Freak, but the developers. It seems like they did a perfectly good job. But it's still true that it sets this, it lowers the standard for what's expected of a Pokemon remake. Previous Pokemon remakes were extensions and progressions of the respective mainline generation of the Pokemon RPGs that preceded them. This is what the Diamond and Pearl remakes offer. It is, does not offer that. And based on that alone, I think the previous Pokemon games were fully compatible in terms of trading and even battling with um, other games in that same generation. The Pokemon Diamond and Pearl remakes on Nintendo Switch uh, do not offer that. They are not part of that same generation. They are not compatible with Diamond and Pearl. I mean, with uh, Sword and Shield. Um, like, the equivalent of some of... If you're not familiar with Pokemon uh, Sword and Shield, I've seen f gameplay. I've, I've watched, like... I've watched, a, like, a four-hour, like, review of, of Pokemon uh, Diamond and Pearl. And pretty much... That game... Like, the, the, the kind of corners Game Freak cuts in the development of, of, uh, Sword, and Sh of Sword and Shield... Are like, let's say you have two characters on screen in the, the regular game mode, not in battle. They're talking to each other, text-based, no voice acting, fine. And if, let's say, the characters shake hands, the, the level of corners Game Freak cuts is such as that, rather than animate the two characters reaching out and shaking hands, they will cut to black. And a text box will appear on the screen saying, the characters have shaken hands. Then it will fade back in and show the character standing there. Because they will wrap, they will they cut corners and show stuff like that. Will cut, they will cut to black and say something happened. Something that is not that significant or hard to animate. For any modern AAA video game of the, of any on any HD system, let alone a Nintendo published headline game. And Game Freak will not do that. They will they will in any other game, what would be an N engine cutscene? Or a um, an either an N engine cutscene, or a um, or a FMV cutscene. They will instead just cut to a static screenshot of what we're supposed to believe happened, as it describes what su we're supposed to s believe happened in text form. That is the epitome of bad graphics to me. Bad graphics is not about oh it's not realistic, oh it's not pushing the cutting edge of what can be depicted. It is depicting what I'm supposed to believe is taking place in the game world to the best of the um, the uh, hardware's capability that reflects the style or mood that the developer intends. And Diamond and uh, the Pokemon games, um, even on 3DS, they were starting to fall short of this. But 3DS, they were limited in what they could do. There are certain corners that I felt were being cut even on in the 3DS era. But I felt like things are improving. Game Freak has to get used to developing 3D Pokemon games. I thought Sun and Moon were a step forward compared to X and Y. And I loved um, Omega Ruby Alpha Sapphire. I thought Sun and Moon in terms of presentation were a step up from that. But I still saw corners being cut. And going to uh, the first uh, mainline Pokemon game on an HD system. And we're, we're going backwards from that. We're... And it's really embarrassing. 
But, so that is all. Oh, you're uh, Clackaboy, you're driving now to get your favorite bubble uh, milk tea? Yeah, so all that being said. All that being said. Uh, yeah, so Pokemon Legends Arceus, uh, Game Freak has been oddly uh, forward in implying through different uh, trailers and things that have been said that it, it seems to be the implication. 2471, our final score of the day. 2471. So we're going to take 2471. We're going to add that into the calculator. Okay. Gonna add that into the calculator. Two, four, seven, one. Calculate. Okay. Twenty-four, eighty-four. Okay, so twenty-four, eighty-four. And what's our previous average? We're gonna this one. And our new average is no twenty. Okay, so our new average is going to be twenty four eighty. No, twenty four eighty five. No, twenty four eighty four. Excuse me. This is, I have to have fewer tabs next time. 2484. So, so calculate. So we've got a 0 0.004. We're so we're Nate. Four five. Four or five. Okay. So we're. We actually have an increase. We're negative, negative 0.04%. So that last uh, score dragged our average down by 0.04%. I'll update the layout next time. Um, and so I want to just finish this thought real quick. So Pokemon Legends Arceus, I mean, I might not be, I mean, it's more action RPG type thing. That might be past my limits of what I'm good at in terms of playing a modern video game. It might not, it might be past the limits. I know because the strictly turn-based traditional Pokemon, I could deal with that. Um, the, um, actually, we'll just go to my end screen. Uh, uh, plugging my, uh, my next uh, stream. Yes. Yeah, it might be um, something I'm not good at. It might be something I'm good at, but not good at streaming yet. And, um, so we'll see what happens. There's a lot of moving parts between whether or not the game's going to be good or not, whether it meets my expectations, whether or not if it does meet my expectations, I'm good at playing it, whether if I am good at playing it, it's something that's good for me to play on stream. I hope it doesn't suck up like a dozen streams like Paper Mario did, even though I love playing Paper Mario, but I want to... I wanna, my, so thank you all for joining me for the least uh, attractive, uh, or least uh, stimulating graphically and... Uh, the least stimulating uh, graphical and um, and audio uh, game I've yet played. Um, now let's. All right. So yeah, the least uh, stimulating game I've I personally have ever played. And uh, so that'll be be it for the stream. I'm going to... Uh, send you all over to, uh, to Pete Door, who is... Uh, I mean, y'all probably know him, but uh, uh, he's the one who got me into this mess to begin with years before I ever imagined I'd be uh, uh, streaming myself. Uh, so I'll send you all over there now. I'll see you on uh, next Wednesday, a week from today at 4 p.m. EST, and thank you very much for watching.
flattering English. Thanks, H. Thank you for the read. Welcome to one of the best reviewed games of last year. pretty poor reviews, but um, I honestly feel like from looking at the gameplay that I looked at before I bought this, I think I know why. And I think the reasons why it got low reviews is something that I'll enjoy, because it's it's essentially a PS2 game with the visuals of like something akin to PS3, except on 